turn on. Insomniac, so it depends on how my evening went. If I'm a morning person, uh, well, I, I did have, I usually go to the bar and I sat down on the couch. I did yoga this morning. See, look at you. Good. Yes. Yes, See if it's actually gonna listen to me today. Oh, no. Aha, uh -huh. there it is. I was like, why aren't it showing up? <laughs> Power strip is off. I love what I make for me. Is that is good morning? Uh -huh. Hello? That's when it says, I'm working. And then we do need the TV because Lazlo's joining us via Zoom. Yes, at eight o'clock. So, it's weird. 
just talking me through my routine so I know what I'm doing. I do that too. <laughs> Ooh, that's it. Find great school special education services, K 12 special education services, transition gifted education options, 504 and swap. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Last one, you guys hear Awesome. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Cool. Yeah, might even squeeze one more into that that list. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me this morning. I know it's been a couple of different times, so I'm really happy to be able to present this material and uh, share this with you. I also want to say, by way of transition, I've had the opportunity to work with Paul. And he's probably out of the room already and on his way, but um, it, it, several times already this year, and he's really a great asset to our school district. Um, we've dealt with some real difficult situations, and he's been able to really connect with families and with um, with kids and got to see that firsthand. So we have a really good, great, great find there in our SRO. So, um, so I'm gonna jump into this. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen okay. Uh, this is a really big picture overview. And I, I know I got to visit with um, Eva and, and Stacy um, after you guys kind of got started. I don't think I had a chance yet to visit um, kind of one-on-one -on -one with John, but um, opportunities, um, what I'm looking for is opportunities to, to do this more frequently with the board and get deep into some of these areas. So a lot of times if I'm up once or twice a year, you're, you're gonna get what you get today, which is like big picture. But what my plans are moving into next year is to dive deeper into each of these areas um, at specific work sessions. And I'll work with, with you all on how you want that to look. But we could spend an hour talking about any one of these areas, so. We can't see your presentation. We can see your screen share, but if you're trying to show us something, we can't see it. So really? right now what you're hearing is the Zoom screen. Okay. I didn't want you to get too far into that, and then, and then. How we, about is that better? No, I can. We only see you right now. Okay. I used the side. This. Let me try this again. Hang on a second. Because it's saying my PowerPoint. There it is. There we go. Now we can okay. see it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so you're getting a um, kind of a big picture overview. And then, like I said, we'll try to dive into some of these areas over the next year um, deeper at, and be able to spend more time with them. So I kind of want to get, I'm going to just jump in here. Um, as you know, student services co covers a pretty wide range of things, gifted, special education, 504. So I did kind of a slide and I'll share this with the board with Heather, so you guys have this material as well. Um, kind of a, an area, just kind of an overview of each area. So we're gonna start off with, with special education, which is the biggest portion of what I do in the district. Um, and be aware that the way our data works within most of our data within special education is um, it's, year, it's year to year data that we look at. So we do a lot of data, we do three big data collections in each year. We have one in the fall that's our um, uh, well, it's, it's fall, but it's December one. And that's our, that's our big one. That's our count date for funding, as well as that really gives us the majority of, our, of the information you're going to see today. And then we do another one in the summer. That's our end of year, which kind of confirms the data for the CDE. So they'll collect, we collect things on December and then end of year is just to kind of confirm. Yeah, that's, that's accurate. Um, and then we also do a, a discipline data collection, which um, is a separate, but it looks at um, our discipline area. So everything that you're seeing here comes out of December count, except for one area, and I'll explain that when I get to it. So first, um, first piece is these are the students we have in our, these are real raw numbers of students we have in our, in our district as of December 1. Obviously, this shifts a little bit 
um, week to week. Um, but this gives you an idea of where we are. Um, so this is right where we wanna be. This is not uncommon. A majority of our students fall within what's called our low incidence areas and that's learning disabilities, uh, speech and language. And um, the other one is the other health impairment as well as development, developmentally delayed. And so let me explain those real quick. Other health, obviously learning disability, I think you guys know what that is. That's somebody, student that has a learning disability in, in any area, reading, writing, math, writing, or reading, writing, or math. Um, speech language, um, we see that a lot in our younger students, uh, preschoolers. Um, it's not uncommon for students to be on a speech language IEP and then a staff out of that after they've been in school for a little while. So we see that pretty commonly in the, in our younger students and then um, more significant needs students um, as we move through the through the years um, of schooling remain sometimes on speech language depending on what what their disability areas are um, the other health impairment is kind of the catch-all it, it's a an area that catches anxiety adhd depression um, some of those things that may not rise to the level of a significant emotional disability but impact the student and they need services around that and then um, our development is delayed is actually um, the only disability here that you age out of before you're out of school. And so um, students can remain on the developmentally delayed um, area until they are eight years old. And at that point, we have to make a decision as to whether they qualify for, we call it one of the big kid disability areas. So we have to make a decision, do they qualify in, in the other areas or, um, or, or do they continue to be considered or, or, or they return to general ed with, uh, with supports. Interestingly enough, developmentally delayed is um, funded differently than the rest of the disabilities. They're all weighted. So students with autism, each of these disabilities actually have a factor. And so we are funded more for significant disabilities like autism, multiple um, emotional disability are all areas that if you want to imagine it, the simplest way is we get almost two times the amount of regular special ed funding. And then our funding for our, our SLD, speech language, most of the other areas is kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, developmentally delayed is a little different. It's actually funded, it's funded at around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So while it's a, it's, a, it's a disability area we do utilize, as you can see, we try to make decisions because we want to make sure we're getting the resources we need to support students. So we'll sometimes move students off of that earlier than, than the eight if we are able to. I'm going to just keep moving, but if you guys have questions, feel free to interrupt. So this is our, was our, uh, when I built this slide deck a couple, couple, well, about a month and a half ago or whatever, this was our ratio. And this is really just a raw count of our students in district and our staff and our staff include this number includes our teachers and our paraeducators. Um, so those are the two people that I'm including in this. Um, and now this doesn't mean that every student on a disability um, has, you know, every four and a half students <laughs> has a, 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 an adult, you know, with them all the time. What this means is this just gives you kind of a sense of where we are with staffing. We have some students that require almost one-on-one. -on -one. Um, um, and then we have students that are very independent, don't even, re, you know, may, may only be checking in or coming to one class with a special ed teacher. So it is, um, it is a wide range and it's based on the needs of that student and how they're progressing. Uh, but we're, we're actually in pretty good shape. I, I don't have a great comparison here uh, because the places nearby, uh, Pooter and Thompson and St. Brain, because of their size, their staffing ratios are are different than ours because they're able to program differently. So, I always I'm always fearful to compare our ratios to other ratios because our small size requires us to be more dynamic and serve kids um, with significant needs in the general ed classroom or in you know in our schools. And so we don't have the opportunity to build center based programs, uh, which is what happens in a lar larger districts which helps this ratio be different because you're, you're doing, um, having students move to a, a location to be able to serve them. We, we serve them in their school. I think that's great. I think it's better for kids, but um, I, and I feel like overall we've done better this year with this ratio. The more difficult thing, I mean, we, I, we could still be hiring more people and we've done a lot of work 
to do that. We've increased our wages. We're, we're working on increasing training. Um, the other side of this, this piece here is retaining, um, especially our paraprofessionals. And so that's a big goal of mine has been this year continuing as we come out of COVID. Um, how do we retain those folks um, besides just pay? What other things can we do to, to make sure we're keeping them? And as we train them and they become more specialized, um, they become a huge part of our, our system as well as our teachers. In addition, um, we are guided by two laws. Yeah, the IDEA is our federal law, as you are probably aware. And then Colorado um, has written, the IDEA is the Individual Disability Education Act. And then Colorado has the Exceptional Children's Education Act, the ECEA. And that is the rules in Colorado. So Colorado interprets, every state interprets the IDEA and writes their own rules. And as part of that, um, we're required to provide staffing, appropriate, highly qualified staff for students with, with disabilities. And that statement sounds on the surface like, oh, well, that doesn't sound too bad. Make sure you got teachers, make sure you got, you can see this list here. This, even though we're a small district, we have to make sure we have this available um, to, to students that need it. And that's, and that's a, a bit of a challenge for us uh, but I feel like we've done great with this over the last, we've really, this has been a big improvement, since, at least since I've been here, um, being able to get folks and keep them. Um, some of them are employees, some of them are contract employees. Um, our contract folks are great. They're individuals that I contract with. Uh, there are tons of companies out there that act as middlemen and try to get, you know, you can imagine you guys, you all of you have different experiences in the private sector, but it's a money-making operation of like, oh, we'll provide you a speech language, but then they charge you a bunch and take top off the money up for their own companies and yada, yada. So I'm really pleased that we have some contract folks, but I contract directly with them as individuals. So there's none of that happening. They've been here for a while. So even though they're not employees, they're, they're familiar with our staff, our system, and pretty much are just like employees. Really excited. We were able to bring a new OT in this year who's going to stay long term. So um, that's been really successful. So just take a quick look at this. This is um, a list of all the staff that we currently have that we provide for students who need that. Not all students need all of this, but um, obviously there are some that need a lot of this. And then the other students, we have one student that actually is visually impaired that requires that, that, spe that specific of a, of a staff member. This is a data point that the state watches closely and we get, um, we, we get, we have a, uh, a, a compliance monitoring uh, process and each year, and we just, we got it after I put this presentation together, I, I probably would have stuck it in here, but we met hundred percent compliance on that. So that was wonderful for our staff. They're, they're rocking it. Um, that's what we want. Um, but they look at, different indicators. You might hear the term indicator. There's indicator 13, indicator 14. There's there's about, I think, 16 of them. And they're different pieces that they look at. And one of them, and it's a big one, is the LRE or the least restrictive environment. And um, the state monitors to make sure that we have, our, that our students, not, not only are our students being educated in, in the general ed as much as possible, but they also even dig down deeper and ensure that we're not violating um, rules where we have uh, disproportionality of like more students of ELL or more students of color who are pulled out of the classroom more than students who are not of color. So they get really deep into that. Um, you can see here though, this is our general, all of our students across our district, our buildings are all over 80%. Um, it ranges a little bit and it's a lot of it's schedule driven. The, high, the elementary is the highest that is sitting around 86 or a, sorry, 80, it's like 88, 89. And then our middle school sits around 86 and our high school sits around 84 or 83, whatever. So they're all above, well above 80, which is the state's, what they're looking at. Like if you drop below 80, they're, they're, they're asking questions of why do you have more than 80% of your students pulled out um, more than 80% more than of their day. So that's kind of a, an 80 for 80, sort of if you can remember it that way. So this is our breakdown. Um, most of our students are in gen ed with their peers most of the day. We do have some students that require more uh, services and you can see that 8% is the 40 to 79% cutoff. 
and then uh, we do have several what you know several students that require more like more of their day, and we do have um, a couple students that are in separate settings right now. And that might be in a different school or in a homebound situation. And actually, one of the students that was in that setting has transitioned back to school since creating this data. So that number would go down a little bit if I when I rerun it. Um, so we have one student that was out 100% on a homebound who's now back in school, almost almost 100% right now. So, so I'm going to switch gears from special ed a little bit and talk about Section 504. And Section 504 is uh, the easiest way to remember is this is this is a civil rights. Um, area. So we move away from the governance for special education is under that those two laws, the IDEA and the ECEA. Um, when we move into Section 504, the governance um, is under federal statute, um, and it's around non-discrimination and those types of things. Um, and the Office of Civil Rights is really who kind of oversees Section 504 um, at the state level, federal and state level, um, and they and we have sets of rules that we follow from that. And so that's kind of generally what Section 504 is. The biggest way, easiest way to remember um, the difference between, between a Section 504 and, and an IDEA is students that have um, Section 504 or 504 plans have a disability that's been, di that's been um, documented, but they don't require services necessarily or very, very, very limited services. So these students require accommodations. They require um, attention paid to their disability to make sure they're successful, but they don't require a specialized instruction or you know, to leave the classroom to get instruction in math or literacy or social skills. Um, we do provide supports for students with 504s within our classroom and, and sometimes in other ways in our buildings to make sure they're being successful. So, could look like a check-in for a student that might be have emotional um, or anxiety or something like that. They might check in with the counselor, but it's more on that general education side of the house uh, where those supports happen. Um, so you can look at our, you can see our numbers. And again, these shifts a little bit up and down, but we are higher, higher at middle and it goes kind of drops as you go up, um, down and that's not unusual. As demands increase, um, parents usually typically start to, re, you know, re, they, as students move from middle or elementary into middle, it's not unusual parents say, yeah, now we're feeling like um, the, the workload is increased to a point where that dyslexia or that um, uh, ADHD is impacting them to where they do need some accommodations. And then we get up into high school where, again, the rigor or the level of intensity increases, the level, level of independence, the number of teachers, all those things impact this. So. Um, not unusual to see this. Um, and these are very, very reasonable numbers for our district size. The other difference with the Section 504 plan is that these students typically, once placed on this, um, typically remain on it. Um, uh, special ed, we look at every three years and a lot of times students come off of that um, because they don't require that level of service. Sometimes they actually go on to a 504 plan after that. So we, we see that happen. Uh, this is the one piece of data that's a little different uh, than the rest of the data I collect uh, for special ed. So I kind of separated it out a little bit. And it's definitely more towards our um, graduation level type of conversations we're having. And so um, this is the, the post school outcomes data is collected. I actually collect it myself. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, I do it just got the list the other day. Uh, and the training. I do it usually over the summer, June, July. Um, we have to wait for school to be done before we can start collecting it. But essentially what I do is I, I call and interview um, the graduates from the prior year. So these are students that grad. So this year I'll be calling, let's see if I can do my math right. I'll be calling students that graduated in 2021 this summer. Students who are, um, had a disability at the time that they graduated or exited. Um, and, and that can include students that aged out or students that dropped out. That's those are all included in this um, in this this collection. So the state provides me a list of the students that they have based on our end of year, all of our data collection. Say these are students that we, as far as we could tell, 
were on IEPs, um, getting services and left your system due to graduation, age out or, or drop out. Um, and so then I make all attempts to reach them or their family and interview them. We have an interview set, uh, set of questions that we have. And really what we're getting at, and you can see the breakdown here is what are they doing when they've graduated? What, what are they doing and how did our services help them? And, we, and, and it's great because in the course of the interview, we can do some learning, even informal learning about maybe things that, that didn't work out so well. So it's a great way for us to check how is our services, especially our high school services, working for students. And so um, you can see here, we have about 25% of our students who move on to some type of post-secondary training. Um, we have um, in this collection, particular last year's collection, we had, uh, so this is the graduates of 2020. That you're looking at here. Um, the employment is students that are full-time employed or part-time employed um, and supported employment means maybe they're significantly disabled but they're still able to work with supports in, in, a, in, a, in a community or in a business, um, community-based business or, or a private business. And then other activities are families or students that maybe are not working, they're at home supporting around the house, um, doing things in the community like volunteering or participating in adult activities, but um, maybe aren't working um, and earning money or, you know, that type of thing. So, and typically we see that with some of our more significant um, students that maybe our families aren't interested in having them work. And this data is interesting in, for, in, uh, in, in Estes Park because um, we have a lot of students that go on to work that I think they do well <laughs> working at Estes Park and they get good pay. And, and so, you know, they, they don't maybe aren't as interested in going to college because they're making a, a good living and doing well with working. So, um, and it fits them better. So we see, we see our, I think we see our employment number probably a little higher than other places where it might be more difficult for them to find work. This is, um, this has been an, an interesting, uh, journey this year, uh, child find and evaluation. So we are responsible for evaluating students zero to 21. Um, that actually changed May 1st. So now it's three to 21. Um, and that, that's that been a big change we've been wor wait, uh, working on. And then we're obviously responsible for serving those students um, now ages three to 21 as well. And so this has been a bit of a, a, a big bubble this year. Uh, we, you can see here by the numbers, we've actually done a lot of evaluations this year, um, and a lot of other school districts are reporting the same thing. And uh, really, there's a part of it is COVID, um, part of it's coming off of COVID. Uh, we, a lot of things were put on hold during COVID. So I'm going to be monitoring this closely next year to see, because I just to give you an idea, typically we would do two to three maybe four child find. Um, those are the little guys come, that haven't been in school yet. And that 23 would typically be, uh, you know, at least a half of that amount, like 10, 11, 12 new identif identified students each year. Um, so this is much higher than we've seen um, ever since I've been in the district. And, uh, and so it's, and it's taking a toll, as you can see, it's a lot of a lot of time um, spent on evaluations and um, and that's, you know, we're hoping that that is going to ebb <laughs> and drop back off, but we'll be watching that. We also have seen an increase in mental health and um, significant emotional types of things happening over the last two to three years, which we think is also pushing this increase a little bit too. Thanks, Leslie, this is great, that's a lot of work. I have a question about that. Just when you say students evaluate, because I feel like I, I'm not clear, like, but you don't diagnose, like, do you say like a student is dyslexic or has ADHD or something like that? Or what, what, what do you say and then what, are, what happens then? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we're looking at a special, ed, these are special education evaluations, by the way, if we're looking at a special education evaluation, um, we have a certain criteria that we follow and, and it's not really, it's not really based on a diagnosis. It's based on, do they meet the eligibility criteria for a learning disability? Um, like another great example would be ADHD. 
there's another health impairment, but there's there's questions in there that say, does this does this disability raise to a significant level that um, meets this this and this that would require um, require special education services? Dyslexia is an interesting one. It falls within um, often students. We don't dis, we don't really diagnose dyslexia now. There's a lot going on at the state level with this. I think this is going to change. Um, I know Boulder School is piloting dyslexia screening. So I, I anticipate we, we will see shifts as, as we move forward with dyslexia in particular being coming more, um, a, a little bit easier to work with within the evaluation system. It's kind of classically been, yes, students that have dyslexia, we then evaluate them for a reading, a specific learning disability in the area of reading, um, which we would, we would expect to see it impacting their reading at a level that would meet that criteria. So it's, it's a, it's, it's, the, the clear answer is we use those uh, all those that information, but we still have to meet our criteria under the under the state law for identifying students with disabilities for special ed. 504 is a little different. Student may have a diagnosis for a, uh, like a dyslexia that comes in from a physician or a or a group that's been working with the family, um, and from that we can develop a 504 plan. We still evaluate. We still look at how is it affecting the student in school. But then we can develop a 504 plan that's based on the needs of that student. Great, thank you. Does that answer it? Yep, good question. Hey, uh, Liza, love Stacy. I have a question. So, are we referring any of the kids? It's like Foothills Gateway, is that still in the, prov helping providing services from that zero to three? Yep. Okay. Yep. Foothills Gateway is providing services. Um, we have, uh, we, yeah, we work closely with Foothills Gateway more so now on the, uh, well, no, on both ends because they provide services for students zero to three. Um, and then we transition those those students transition that we call it C to B. So part C is the transition or is the services they get at, on an individual service plan through Foothills Gateway. And then as they reach the age of three, those services transfer to the school. So we evaluate, do they meet our requirement? You know, does that student meet the requirements under ECEA to get services as a preschool. A lot of those students go under that developmentally delayed um, label I talked about earlier, and then those students will then get their services in our pre in our preschool. Yeah, and then they also we work closely with Foothills Gateway as students transition out of our our uh, district. In particular, our significant needs students will qualify for waivers through Foothills Gateway for employment, independent living. Um, respite care for families. There's a multitude of services they provide as students exit. The exit age of students with disabilities in Colorado is 21. So they can, main, they can remain with us. And we do have some students that remain with us until they turn 21. Um, the criteria around that is that they need, to, they need continuing special ed services to meet their goals. So it's a small number of students, um, but there are at least a few students that, that typically stay on until 21. And then I have another question. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times anxiety, emotional uh, needs to check into the students. Do you anticipate um, more of our children needing 504 services based on that? Yeah, I do. And I think we're also going to see an increase in dyslexia requests. We are already um, because it's becoming a lot more um, acceptable and there's a lot more, there's a lot more knowledge and work being done. But I do think we're, we do, we have seen, and I think we're going to continue to see increase in mental health needs. Um, we're trying to work, you know, we did a lot of work before COVID. And I think we need to go back out to our um, community providers because we, what we were seeing, what we're seeing again is doctors writing a script, like literally uh, 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 like what, you know, what you would use to go into the pharmacy to get penicillin saying this student needs a 504. And it's like, well, we need more information. We need to understand why you think that physician or, or evaluator, and then we can use that information and work with the student and evaluate their needs at the school, which is, when I use the word evaluate, it's a very wide range. It's really looking at their needs. It's talking to teachers, talking to interviewing the student, um, looking at their grades, looking at their work to, to really determine how is this, how is this affecting them? Um, and a lot of times we can get those answers when we pull all that information together. But I, I do see an increase. I do have seen an increase, and I anticipate, and and, and all the um, all the areas I've been tracking and following, and and in my uh, state level and regional level meetings, it's it's we're seeing it across the board. So. 
So. Thank you. So I'm going to switch gears a little to gifted and talented. Um, I know this is one of the end, one of the goals uh, that we have, and our goal around gifted and talented in in the UIP um, was to diversify our identification processes to be able to make sure we're we're identifying you know students who require gifted and talented services from a from from all of our population. So looking at you know, are we making sure we are, we call it casting a wide net to ensure that students who might be ELL or um, even disabled, that we're not missing those students in our, in our gifted, talented processes. So um, that's the goal that's, 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 that's in the UIP. Um, what you're looking at here is actually results of a gifted education monitoring process we had last summer. Uh, Jason actually was part of that. He came in and talked a little bit about the global outcomes and some of the work we were doing in the we were doing in the district. And so, the what that looked like was the state um, came and they had a team that met with us for two days, and we presented uh, all of our processes and shared all of our documents and our handbooks and um, and did interviews with them and talked with them. And then they provided us a pretty nice thorough report. Um, it was really a, a big success. Our the, those those happen every five years. And the prior one we had, I think we had 11 areas that were out of compliance. And on the one we did last summer, uh, we had no areas out of compliance. And we had two areas that were ones that we were just needing to fine tune. So we made a lot of big growth in our district over the last five or six years. That doesn't mean we're done. <laughs> um, I think what it did do was point, to, point out to us what areas we really wanna work on and how we can get to that. And so that's what you're looking at here is the goals that we developed from our GEM process. Um, this came from our PLC, which is our folks at each building that support gifted um, students. Um, and then we share this information um, with our principals and such as we move along. And, and so we identified four goals that came out of that gem. And uh, first of all, on the left, you can see our numbers. Those numbers are definitely different now. We've identified quite a few students in the last few months because we did screening at the elementary. I th just so you all know, we have a big bubble of second graders, uh, 10. <laughs> so yeah and they're like all solid identified like it's not even like questionable and then there's four or five that we're monitoring so if i were to put them in this is you know this almost double our our numbers at the elementary as you can imagine so um or more than double so but this gives you a general idea these numbers fluctuate um but i do we do have more now at the elementary because of that bubble in second grade that we just identified a couple of weeks ago um, these are our four goals. And so we are identifying um, structures within our, within our GT programming and fine tuning those. Uh, the consolidation of data is we've been moving towards having all of our plans centralized and available to teachers. Um, and so that's been, um, that's been a, big, a big part of what we've been doing last year and really a lot of that this year. We should be finished with this by the summer. We're going to take the last of our when I started there, were, when I started working with gifted and talented three years ago, there were plans everywhere, guys. Like there were Google Docs. There were somebody had a hard file. Somebody, somebody kept it on the uh, on a on a spreadsheet. I mean, there was like everybody did it differently. So we really made a we really made a concise decision that we're gonna not only have it on frontline, but we're gonna have a date that we're gonna have all those developed by, and we're gonna make sure we're all kind of following the processes to make sure we've got. Um, those in place for students. Uh, the number three has been a big one. We've been working in particular at the high school. And when I get deep with gifted and talented with the board, with all of you, we I would like to show you some of that work. It, it's It's been um, very eye-opening and we've done a lot, especially at the high school to really start to shift the way we provide plans for uh, students who are gifted and talented, doing more around their interests and really linking it to the ICAP and what they're going to do as a career or for post-secondary. So really making it meaningful as opposed to just some plan that we wrote that says you're going to keep working on you know, this area or that area. We really want it to be something that those students are part of and that makes sense for their trajectory through high school and, and graduation. And then number four, we're just beginning to touch the touch number four. We haven't done a lot of work with it. We actually haven't even finished writing the goal yet because we needed to 
top three to kind of be in place. And number four is now how do we develop programming and train teachers to enhance what we're doing for gifted, talented students in our in our system. And um, I always really, if we do this well, it's not just going to impact gifted and talented students. It's going to impact all students. We're talking about good practices around differentiation, being able to pay students, being able to provide different avenues for learning, um, which are all part of everything else we're doing with, with global outcomes, as well as uh, providing students with um, personalized kind of options to be able to show their learning. So that we're just starting to get into and we're um, going to begin that work with principals this year. Uh, this summer, have a, we, we got a kind of an initial kickoff to that. And I have a feeling we'll be, that'll be our big deep dig, deep dig um, next year is to work on our training and professional development planning. Laszlo, can you go back to identify students? One of the goals that the superintendent goals is our gifted divergent and explain, I know that Eric and uh, um, Jason and Eric are probably aware of this, but we were flagged by the state because our demographics in our gifted program don't reflect the demographics in our school. So this is one of our goals. Can you talk about how identifying students has changed? Yeah, I can. And by the and by the way, they they are they do they do reflect now. We've identified, we've actually met that goal. We've identified several students um, diverse. We've diversified that because our numbers are so small. So if you if you can look at it, like two or three students can make a big difference in this. And we've actually gotten way further along the line. But but what we've done in practice to do this, what's that? It may change with our second grade bubble because it's yeah. not really yeah. diverse. It's a huge bubble. Um, but you, will you talk about the changes in testing and identifying that we put forth in the last yeah. couple of years? The other board members so, may not know about. Yeah, so we've been working hard, um, working closely with the school MTSS teams um, to, to make identification part of what we do with MTSS. So we, we're looking at a body of evidence. We're looking at um, multiple data points on students from multiple places, not just one test or two tests, not just state tests, but you know what, how they're doing in classroom, how they're doing um, in different areas. And then most recently, and I think this is what's been really, um, help, is really helping us move forward with this is we've been able to, the state ha has released um, and allowed some flexibility in the way this is done. And they've allowed us to look at WIDA which is our, our evaluation of students um, who are receiving ELLs, ELL services. Um, and we're able to look at the, tra the trajectory of students as they're moving through that um, and how quickly they're moving through their WIDA levels to be able to identify, use that as part of the body of evidence to say, well, the student may not be hitting this, this, or this point, but look at how, look at compared to their peers, look at how fast they're moving through the, these levels of, of WIDA. Um, and so we are able to use that and have identified some students um, when we add that into their body of evidence, because that really is a true marker of what growth, what's the potentiality of that student. And we don't want to, that's, that's, that's one of the pieces that we didn't want to miss in our body of evidence. So. Thanks, Lancelot. Yep, and having a team approach to that, it's not one person in a room, it's um, a PLC team and an MTSS team that do, the, do those identifications, so. Great. You guys ask questions throughout, so I think we're we're good. And I'm almost out of time, but I wanted to just take a couple minutes to go over SWAP because I know um, Stacy got the, the contract for that. And so I just wanted to explain that to you. It doesn't require, under statute, it doesn't require a voter approval with the board, um, but I want you to have knowledge of it. It does require Stacy as the board president to to sign the contract because it's a state it's a state contract procurement thing that they have, but um, but we've basically every year forever we've applied for this. It's a it's a grant. Um, it, and basically what it does is it provide the state pays for um, a staff member to provide work uh, work support for students with disabilities that includes special education and 504 ages 16 to 25. So we can serve students even after they're out of school with that. Um, and basically SWAP, which stands for School to Work Alliance Program, is a partner with uh, the Division of Voc Rehab. 
and the state of Colorado. And essentially what we do is we uh, provide a staff member that does a lot of work with our high schoolers as they get to juniors and seniors to help them prepare for work or post-secondary. Um, that could look like interviewing skills, developing their resume, um, being strategic about what, their, what, what school they might go to or what program or um, training program they might choose to, to pursue in order to do what they wanna do. And then it goes further than that. Uh, that's called the pre-employment services. And it goes further and, and our SWAP um, coordinator who's Marsha Weaver, we, uh, we hired her this past um, January. Um, she, uh, she can go out and do job coaching, job development. So work with community providers to say, hey, which we would like to find some placements for students to get experience. Sometimes it's unpaid, sometimes it's paid, depends on how, how that all works. Um, but the idea is not only to provide that pre-training pre for those students in school, but also to provide them um, structures and supports at, after they get out of school. And then we partner with DVR, Division of Voc Rehab, Rehab also kicks into that and they have job coaches and they come and will work partnering with us once we get a student a position, they'll provide job coaching as well. All this is free to the family and the student. Um, it's, part of, it's part of what we can provide as kind of a bridge service. And so each year we do, a, we do an application for that um, and we apply and they, and they pay for, uh, they, they pay for 50, they pay for the teacher and then we match that funding to help pay for other costs like travel and cell phone and things like that, rent. We have an office over in the learning place. We share a space with the learning place and that's our swap office. So for, for any students that are out in our community that might be done with school can come in and get services there and, um, and connect with Marsha there. So um, each year we do that, we apply, um, we have certain outcome numbers that we need to meet um, and they track that very closely with us. And that's how we continue to get funding for those that position, but it's really nice. It's kind of like free money for the district um, and the opportunity to, to provide great services for our students. So I did wanna kind of just give you guys a picture. I know Eric and uh, Jason have, have seen some of the SWAP presentations in the past. Um, we weren't able to pull that together because Marsha's super new and learning right now. But um, we, I did want to share that with you so that we can move, hopefully, move forward with that. Um, it's great, great service for our, our community. So, any questions on that? Stacy, are you comfortable hitting the docu sign? I actually uh, can review it, and if I have further questions, I'll reach out to you or Ruby. Yep, and and Brian's very involved too because we have to okay. submit all the budget stuff. So if you have any questions, um, me or Ruby or Brian can all, well, probably me and Brian, uh, Ruby, I'm sure have seen it, but specific like budget types of questions, we can help you understand that, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Laszlo, you, you hadn't, uh, I know you ran out of time, but you hadn't touched on the options uh, portion of your um, responsibilities. Oh, yeah, so I will do that really quickly. Um, we are, we just got the green light to continue out at the YMCA. So that's wonderful. And um, we are going where our numbers have been pretty, pretty, pretty much rise slowly rising over the last year coming out of COVID. So we have, um, we have start, we have some families that have been reaching out and interested next year. So we, we run somewhere in the neighborhood of about, uh, we've been running about 30, 35 to 40 students uh, this year. Um, and so we'll see where those numbers kind of wind up, but we have a pretty big range from kindergarten to eighth grade right now. And uh, nobody in high school, but that's uh, an area that we're keeping an eye on as students get older, whether we're gonna continue um, students into a high school level program, which we've done in the past um, and can do again. And so we're, we're monitoring that. No one's, no one's asked about high school yet. Um, and we can put that together if that becomes a need. But right now we have, um, uh, four teachers that are planning on returning. And it's been great. The, the YMCA has been wonderful. They charge us about half the amount of money we were paying prior. And it's been a great partnership. They allow us really use of all the facilities. Um, we've been able to take the kids roller skating and we use the Hempel and it's been just, it's been a really nice partnership. So 
Um, we're planning on continuing that um, just like it was this year, next year on Thursdays, uh, Thursdays. And we also have curriculum available for families as well. So speaking from a uh, budget and resource uh, viewpoint, do you feel you have the, do you have what you need for uh, the slow rise of the number of students and then uh, continuing to service the program as it is? Yes. Yeah, we're doing, we're actually very stable. We're more stable than we've ever been. Part of that is I've been able to hire um, YMCA people <laughs> who are full-time employees at the YMCA, but I worked with Susan Taylor and she was able to flex their schedules to where they can work with us one day a week. So that has made the staff, and I still have some other folks that are not in, you know, uh, Melinda Workman and Vicki, um, who are not um, in that, who just work for options. But um, we, this is the most solid staffing scenario we've had. They're all, everyone there is highly qualified, either has teaching or teaching credentials or youth credentials. Um, so it's, that has really helped that partnership because that was the hardest part before was finding qualified people who I could retain and keep on one day a week. Um, so it's, yeah, that's, we're in, we're in really good shape up there uh, with options resource wise right now. I'll let you know if it changes, but. Hey, Liza, one question I get from when I'm talking to options parents is making sure we're keeping them in the loop about uh, post after school activities. So can we make sure that like for next year, we have a way to loop them in on yeah. that? Information? Yeah, we actually are gonna, there's a, the nice thing is we're moving uh, the way we're doing the enrollment of option students next year um, within PowerSchool to be attached to the school that's attached to their grade level. So they will be able to, once, once we get their enrollment moved back over into the school, they will be on all the emails, every communication that goes out from the school, they will have access to those. Great, thank you. So I'm, hoping, I'm really thinking that's good. I'm really hoping and believing that's gonna help with that. Uh, we do communicate our own option stuff, but I think that'll help close that gap uh, for our students that are, yep, yep, good question. All right, you guys, I gotta run. Thank you so much um, for your time and I'll be, I'll be sending, um, I'll continue to send you updates as we move on into the year of, of anything else that I need to have um, you be aware of. Great, thanks for all your hard work in so many areas. It's gotta be a lot to juggle. I love it. I love the hats. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thanks, Laszlo. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your afternoon or day. All right. Um, agenda item three, discussion items. A is the goals help check. Um, and we uh, lumped in with that the communication plan discussion as well. So I thought everybody should have either a physical copy or on our iPad a copy of the goals. Yep. Good. We got John back on. Yeah. Okay, great. So a big jump in. All right, awesome, John. I thought we can just uh, jump in from the top and start going through and providing statuses and jump in with information. And then um, Jason for the communication part. I thought we could talk about the. Great. Can we get down to communication. Incorporate Great. that in that next section. Great. Thank you. So rural learners um, board uh, task one commit to chosen education topic at each work session. Um, restorative practices. I think that was impacted by Mary moving over to um, the high school as principal being she was our coordinator at the middle school and I was going to ask Ruby what was the plans moving forward for that so we can ask that when she gets back. Um, the science curriculum updates the next generation science we had the presentation for the science curriculum at the middle school on May 2nd and we have the one this evening for the high school. I had or, elementary sorry, school. Elementary. <laughs> My bad, elementary school. Um, and I believe that's on the calendar so all of us can okay. um, attend that. 
Um, I know the distinction between competency and uh, base grading and equity grading. Uh, the students came in and gave us a presentation that um, we'll ask. I, I know that they sent their presentation to me and I sent them back a note. I don't think I saw any of the other board members on that presentation. I didn't get it. Yeah, I don't think so. So I sent a note back to them saying, please give it to all of us and it's all the board members. Okay. So we can um, get more information on that. And then I know Ruby, have they had more conversation at the high school regarding that with the teachers? I think May 7th. And yeah, Mary shared about that in the board meeting last month of um, what they did on that May 7th or March 7th day. Oh, and March, yeah. That professional development, what their next steps are going to be as a staff. Um, I'm just curious. So I, I actually think it's an interesting topic, and no one else might. The distinction between uh, competency based grading and grading for equity. Um, and, and Ruben, I'm curious your thoughts. I feel like they're different things, but they get in our district, I feel like they're kind of collapsed into one. Um, and so like when the, the school is doing competency-based grading, we're moving that way if the district is. Would you agree with that? Kind of. Through our professional learning, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a good thing because that way students are assessed on what they know, not based on seat time or homework percentages or stuff like that. Um, and I think one of the benefits of it is it's more equitable. Um, but my concern is people refer to it as grading for equity when it's competency based grading. And I think equity is a really important thing. And I think if we want to discuss that, we should do it well. But I think sometimes when we're trying to talk about grading, people are talking about equity um, and they get collapsed and it kind of gets in, makes things complicated because people have different interpretations of equity and they then collapse that. Because people think like, I think some people when this first came out was like grading for equity, you're giving certain kids higher grades just to make them feel better, which is not true. But I think it's a misunderstanding of it. So I don't know if that's a worthwhile discussion or not. That's where it came from. So. I think it's a very worthwhile discussion, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. I think it's worthwhile as well because um, I know it was introduced mostly to parents back in April last year, not this April, the previous, no, why are you getting all my Aprils? Previous April. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I was the recipient as a parent at that point. And when all the grading for equity came out, there's a lot of questions. And I think there's still a lot of confusion on what does it mean. Um, I know we have the grading commitments on our website um, for the school district, but I, I think we do need uh, further communication and discussions on this topic. It's a very confusing topic, I would say, between the students just looking at their um, outcome of their survey and for the parents. I think it's worthwhile where that lands. Uh, maybe Ruby, you can follow. I know there's a parent group as well. I believe that Mary was gonna try to get back engaged and continue that conversation. I think we do need to have the conversation and continue that so there's a better understanding in the public and with the students. Because when you look at the students, they seem very confused as, as well. And their survey, I think, um, indicates there seems to be what they feel, their perception, is it's not consistent. And that's a problem. And I hear that frequently from students as well. So I do think there needs to be um, additional conversation, not just at the board level, but on down as well. Now, how that happens, I don't know. Um, if we go back to Mary's group and that parent group and start that discussion there and make sure students are involved in that group as well, I, I'm open to ideas. Yeah, and it's complex. Like, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. I think they're complex com concepts. I think it's complex, and I think that people, A, don't realize our grading commitments, or even on the website, um, and then do we understand them as a community? I think that's a, an area of concern as well. So I agree with you, Jason, on that. And then maybe- I'd like that's to, um, I'd just like to say that uh, Part of the grading equation 
is developing a sense of accountability and responsibility. I know in my son's store trying to uh, have, there's mostly high school students that are working there and showing up on time, being there. And, you know, I think, you know, grading, um, being accountable, being responsible, they are all important aspects other than on, uh, along with the grading for competency. John, I agree. Being accountable, being on time, getting your work done is very important. I think sometimes where things get collapsed is if you get a B in Algebra 2, does that B mean that you understand Algebra 2? Or could that B mean you, sh you showed up on time, you did all your homework, but didn't understand it? And I think part of grading for competency, my understanding is like your grade should reflect what you understand, what you know, as far as what's taught. And getting your work done, being on time are all important, and we can work on structures for that. But I think they're distinct. So I think that makes the grade or whatever you said more meaningful. Yeah, just on the, account, not accountability, but just well, being accountable for yourself, saying, okay, I'm doing the homework. I don't really understand it. So it's the student can come up to the teacher without the teacher taking the initiative. Yeah. and say, I'm doing the work, but I'm still struggling. I'd like some help. I mean, that's where I'd like to see, you know, students also have some responsibility in taking some initiative. Yeah, it's a super important skill. It is. Advocating for yourself. And I think, too, uh, in the past, Ruby and I have talked that uh, that's a, what do you call it, a key component of grading for equity, because the students have to step up on their own to represent themselves to a teacher or to ask for more help or uh, to advocate for themselves maybe to um, be able to do better or I guess just get help would be the way to put that. Is that true, Ruby? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Everything that you are saying here is the goal of the teachers <laughs> yeah. and what mm -hmm. we're working toward. Um, do you want me to share in, in, do you want me to share my perspective? Yeah, sure. okay. yeah absolutely. Okay. We want as much from um, you as you can, like, because okay. you're the expert. Um, besides. So we have, you know, I've been here a long time and we have a long history of showing that we have a large number of students that are failing classes yeah. and have to do credit recovery. And we struggled for a long time, decades with the high school with how that credit recovery looks and how students recover that credit and how they show their learning because of the high number of students failing, which doesn't always coincide with where students are scoring on the ACT and the SAT. We have typically scored about at the state average, yet we have a high number of students failing classes. So we've had this big question mark of why. And we've also had a long history of students saying that they feel grading is biased for a long time, that um, a lot of times grading is a judgment by the teacher and not really what they're learning in the classroom. And feel like it's not always fair that they, when they get the grade, that it feels fair to them in the classroom. So we've been working as teachers to increase our professional learning surrounding how to make our grades three things, more accurate, speaking to the competency base of what the students actually know and are able to do in the classroom, more bias resistant and more motivational because we know our systems and structures aren't working for all students and they're not motivated in the classroom. And a large part of why they're not motivated is the way they're assessed and evaluated by their teachers or that they feel learning is purposeful and relevant to them. So those are the three areas we looked at. Um, we've read a lot of works from a lot of researchers to help us improve. And I think the, the crux of the matter is that change is really hard for teachers. A punitive grading system is not so hard. <laughs> the student doesn't do it, they get the, the mark, we move forward. It doesn't require the student and the teacher to build an, a learning alliance and work really hard at learning together. It's, they didn't turn it in a zero, we move on. And so we're stopping and saying, wait a second, learning is what's important here. We need to keep the learning going. And so by making our grades more accurate, bias resistant and motivational, we focused on what are some more innovative grading practices that we can use in order to improve learning in the classroom and more accurately measure learning in the classroom. And so that's where we, that's the intentionality and that's the goal of our teachers. 
What we know now is we have a lot more work to continue to do in professional development and teacher learning. Um, the, what we're hearing loud and clear from our students is that I get what you're doing. I agree with making grades more motivational, more accurate and more bias resistant, but you're doing it in so many different ways. Yeah. It's not consistent. Yeah. And so our next steps, and I think you heard Mary say this at the board meeting is to get with teachers. And what we did, and I'll summarize what she said, because I, I know <laughs> and I participated, um, what, what they did in their leadership asked, in their leadership team after the May 7th is they went to their PLCs and they said, what are the promising practices that are working in our classrooms we're having a lot of success with that are bias resistant, motivational, and accurate. And this is the work we've actually, we've always been having those reflective conversations through all of this. We've been sharing with each other what's working, what's really working well, what's going well in our classrooms. And so we're continuing to do that. And so teachers have identified some things, some promising practices that they have shared with each other, brought back to leadership and um, started to update the playbook. The teachers have a shared grading for equity or grading commitments playbook is what it's called. And their grading commitments playbook has those promising practices that they're doing that are working, that they're sharing across their PLCs and across the, with all teachers. And as a result, getting tighter on those commitments with, we're gonna commit to this, you know, one of the practices that showed up was some of the, on the freshman team, they had a list of everything that was due in the deadlines in their classrooms and they crossed it off as they, they did. And they were really getting tight on putting that M in the grade book so that the students knew it was missing and they needed to turn it in in order to improve their grade and just really getting tight on some of those practices. So seeing it started to be more consistent for students um, and making it visible in the classroom and just these practices that really help students build those skills. So they shared some of those that they all want to commit to. So we're just continuing to develop those commitments so that it is more consistent. I think one of the things that's hard is that we teach a diverse array of content areas and subjects and what is going on in band doesn't exactly replicate what's happening in math. Those grading commitments are vague for a reason because it looks different across the different disciplines. And so while we all may be committed to allowing students to relearn and retake something, that may look different in band where it might be a performance assessment than it does in math where they've had a large test and they're just retaking something, one concept they missed. So um, that, that is something important to teachers is that it's flexible based on our, we are all committed to this thing, but it doesn't need to look exactly the same in each classroom. And it never, it never really has, um, it, which is the honest point. Right. <laughs> it, it never really has looked the same. Um, so that's the continued work that we're doing. I think to Jason's point, competency-based being different than our grading commitments, um, our grading for equity, they're different in some ways and they're so aligned in some ways. Like they're aligned in the fact that we wanna make our grade an accurate reflection of what students know and are able to do and what they've learned. They are competency-based gets more to the very specific details of each, each learning target in the classroom and measures each one of those learning targets in the classroom, rather than lumping into what we call an omnibus grade, that's an A, even though some of those learning targets you got an A in, but some of those learning targets you're at a C level actually. So it's really communicating more accurately to the student and the parent where you are in each of those learning targets. Um, but then the equity piece comes in, in the fact that in hearing from lots of stories from students and parents and teachers, the bias part of grading, it feels inequitable when this student is allowed to retake because they were absent from class for this reason. This student's not because they were absent from class for this reason. And then the teacher is making a judgment on the reason you were absent was valid, but the reason you were absent is not valid. That's where it feels inequitable to students. And they feel like teachers are making a judgment based on my obstacles and my barriers and my hardships, whether my hardships are just as valid as someone else's. And it begins to feel inequitable in the classroom. So a commitment of, we're not gonna judge the hardships students are facing, but we're gonna allow every student to work hard and make their grade improve is a commitment where it's an attempt by the teachers to take the bias away and the judgment they have 
a way and allow this opportunity for everyone in the classroom, regardless of the barrier, barrier you are facing, and then work restoratively with the parents and the students to gain those skills in those areas of global outcomes. So um, we have a lot of work to still do in this area is what I'd say overall. Like we, yeah. we have a lot of work to do in partnering with students and families, communicating, and especially in improving our instructional practices. Just the work that we keep doing. So overall, that's kind of- Which my, is great, and I assessment. appreciate that. <laughs> and I think, I mean, what Ruby's talking about is where our goal is to get, you know, if mastery or excellence is our goal, like before, students of quality work was pretty variable, but time was consistent. We kept marching on. Now we're saying we want to hold this high bar of excellence and get more students up there learning, mm -hmm. which is great. And it's a really complicated thing. And it sounds mm -hmm. like you guys are working really hard on it. I think there's some onus on us in the community to give the staff the space to develop those skills. They need to kind of reprogram how they think about grading. And so it's a difficult process. At mid-year, we shared the movement in our grades. And you'll see it's not a whole lot of movement. Maybe 2% increase in the A's, 2% decrease in the F's. Um, and I think it's a go slow to go fast situation as we learn and get better at these yeah. practices because it is, it is different than what traditional systemic grading has been like for over 100 years. And so... Um, within these practices, we aren't, we aren't changing our grading policy. We're still on a hundred point system. We're still on an ABCDF system. Mm -hmm. What we're changing is our commitments to kids. Mm -hmm. That's and commitments to our teaching practices and assessment practices. That's what we're, that's what we're working on changing. And it's hard work. Mm -hmm. Any, any improvement in teaching instructional practices is really hard work yeah. and it takes time yeah. to refine and, and, um, Reflect. I'm not going to say perfect. I'm trying to avoid the word perfect because it will never be perfect because <laughs> nothing is an education, but to refine and, and improve. Well, it may be as we go that uh, board work can be that we uh, redefine or sharpen the uh, communication to the public that the goal here is education. Right. There's two different ways to do it. We have competency based, we have grading for equity. But our goal is, is learning for kids, is education of the kids. Uh, and we're starting to look at doing it in a different way that, again, you know, raises, you know, raises more kids to that bar. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it'll be important for the board as we look at communication when we talk about communication to the public in whatever form that takes. That's going to be important for us to explain it in a way that is. Uh, more palpable to the general public. What does this mean? How does that, what does it look like? Uh, and I think it's one of those things can be that, uh, what's the goal? Right. We're, we're not necessarily getting them ready for having a job. That can be a byproduct of learning in that you have to hand in uh, certain uh, uh, reports or, or uh, you have due dates you have to be, that have to be met. But that were, uh, and so, so that's a byproduct of what we're doing, but the focus here is, is teaching kids and it's learning for the kids. And then byproducts of that can be in this way, but it's a very different, uh, almost a bomb. I'm starting to like your words more, Ruby, it's like it's in a different lens. We look at it in a slightly different way than what we have in the past. That might be something for the board to consider as we start to work into the communications piece and our job out to the public. I agree, Eric. I think, um... The student voice, I think, is so important. We keep, you know, I keep going back to that because, like, one of their questions is, do you feel you've learned more with new grading practices? And 32% um, said no. That's a third of our kiddos. Well, of the 90 that filled the survey up. Yeah. Pardon me? It's 30% of the 90 that filled the survey of up. Of the 93 responses, exactly. And then, so I guess where I'm going with that is their perception along with the parents is really important from a viewpoint of if they don't feel like this is helping them learn more, which is the one of the primary drivers and the primary goals, then we need to re address that and have more conversations along that line. I, I'm because I think oh. I just want to you said 32% said they're not learning more 
with a new grading practice. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, 30, yeah, about a third of 32.3, so, where 28% is saying yes, and 39%, 39.8 is saying it's the same. So they're saying they're learning less with the new grading? They're just saying 30 out of the students. Okay. Here's a question Do you feel you've learned more with new grading practices? 39.8 says it's the same. Okay. 32.3 is no. And 28 is yes. Okay. Where I, in my mind, uh -huh. part of the driving is to help them learn more. So if they don't understand a concept, we're trying to go back, reteach, so they do learn more, so they do help them, right? They're getting their foundation to keep building. Yeah. No, it's just inter I'm grappling with that question because what I hear from that, and I definitely think we should do better and we can do better, but there's no difference between like, I'm learning the same under the situation and I'm not learning more. Like that's, so they're not, both of those groups are not learning more, but they're learning the same. Uh, and then like 30% are learning more. So right now we got 30% learning more and 70% doing the same. And we want to bring that up. There's been no deficit. So is that question subjective? Definitely. To what, <laughs> to what you know, how you measure and what they're learning because what they're learning might not be part of that equation as far as the grading aspect. That makes sense? Yeah. Yep. So I, I'm very visual. I know. <laughs> and I'm very intrigued and interested in getting the survey shared so I can look at it. Um, and I do think that a very important piece of um, looking at grading for equity, the grading competencies, is the communication piece so that people really understand what all of it means. I think there's just some confusion um, from the, obviously from parents, from students, from the community, so that, you know, and it is a work in progress and things and education take time. Mm -hmm. You don't see that snap of a finger and it's done and everybody gets it and let's implement it and do it. No, it takes time. Mm -hmm. So um, all those pieces working together and then communication being a major factor in that um, process is important. So and how that looks like, you know, with the board, but more, you know, in addition to the board, you know, through the school system, you know, hearing it directly from, you know, maybe a open house, you know, presentation to parents. I don't know. There's multiple ways to communicate, you know, what this looks like, what this means, that it's a work in progress, that it's not something that we have defined, we have implemented, and this is what's happening. It, it to even communicate that that piece of it is, you know, we're getting it together. And I love the idea that the teachers are putting that playbook together. Yeah. That's incredible. And then they're fine tuning that playbook based on what they are, you know, learning and growing as, you know, this process is proceeding. And we've talked in the past about uh, almost an NLC type based, because that was so successful to get great community feedback. Uh, in, in doing just what exactly what you're saying, Abel, right. just taking this concept, this idea, having almost learning uh, presentations uh, uh, around the community on some sort of a regular basis that people can attend or do that kind of thing where uh, we can kind of put this out there to begin educating the public and the parents about what this concept is because it is so different than traditional. Grade. And I think we have to look at the effectiveness of the communication piece that we use. Sure because I know that that was used with global outcomes, but you know, you want to open up to the public, but then there are those barriers that may cause some people who have questions not to be able to be part of that process. So it has to be open to everyone 
Yeah, and then so LCs work on multiple we, levels. We kind of did that, did that way, and then took in feedback, and then the board members or presenters got back to them with questions that we didn't have an answer to, and then brought and then put all that together, and then came back and, and had a bunch of people that uh, uh, a number of people were invited that had participated and said, "Here's what we've heard." Right. Let's just start to answer some of your questions. Well, I'm thinking of you know our population of students, the twenty percent that are. Um, English second language learners mm -hmm. and their yep. families. You know, we've got to be sure we're communicating to everyone yep. so that there's an understanding. Yeah, exactly. And then they also you kind of concept did that. So, well, guys, I have to leave for a doctor appointment while I'm here in 45 minutes. So I'll get it. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Sorry. I would add one more, one more piece as far as understanding that it's the understanding you're working um, Our we often talk about this as if our grading practices are separate from our instructional practices. Right. Like we instruct, we do these teaching and learning practices in the classroom and then it all comes down to the grading. But you mentioned the playbook, which is now 16 months in the working and continuing to develop. Our grading practices must always be tied to our instructional practices. We're changing from a, a philosophy of I'm the teacher and I'm the keeper of the knowledge and I dump it onto the student and the student repeats it and then I grade based on what they can repeat to I am in a learning alliance with this student and knowledge is constructed and it's in constructed in many ways and it's constructed differently for different students. And where we began on this journey years ago was looking at our data and having questions about equity because what we've seen in a long time is that there is a higher percentage of our students with disabilities and our students that are emerging bilinguals failing than the rest of our students. And that doesn't sit right with our teaching staff. And okay. that's where we started with this, all of this work and asking ourselves, why is that? Mm -hmm. What is going on in our instruction and our grading that's causing this? And is our instruction aligning with our grading? And a lot of the reflection that the teachers had is actually, my instruction matches my beliefs about learning, but my grading doesn't. And why am I grading this way when I don't believe that's how students learn? And so we started asking these really hard questions of ourselves and digging in more and more. And it's it's messy and it's hard work. And Ruby, I would add to that. I would ask that question, is our supports where they need to be for those students, right? If we're talking about our EL kids and our disability kids, that causes me to step back and question, do we have the right supports in place at the right time? Exactly. And providing access. So to me, it's not just grading, it's yeah. stepping back. Do we have for our kids who need support, the accurate supports in place? Yes. And then it's, it's questioning the teaching and learning well. cycle. And that's yep. what we're that's the intention of these commitments we have. It's not no longer they didn't get it. Okay, moving on. It's they didn't get it. Why? Right. Are we meeting the needs based on their specific learning disability? Are we meeting the needs for this emerging bilingual student? And where are the gaps? And let's dig deeper and let's try again and let's give some other opportunities and let's try it differently. And all of these things emerge rather than just saying, I taught it, they didn't get it, moving on. Um, which is not what teachers have ever wanted to do. But in traditional grading practices that we've had, that was what we were doing and it didn't feel right to us. And so those are just, I've been in these conversations with teachers so much that um, I wanted to share that that's where the intention is. We're not doing it perfect right now by any means. Um, we didn't communicate it well, and I take a lot of responsibility for that. But that doesn't mean we're not going to improve and be better, which is what we'll do, which well, is what we're trying to do. To, um, the children that need support because of their language, um, the children with disabilities, making sure that their 504s and IEPs needs are being addressed and they are individualized. And that is part of what you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. So, and then in addition to that, you can go on because I think it's easy for, as a previous educator, to forget our gifted children you know, they still need to be sure that they are receiving 
what they need to be able to grow and extend more than just the, you know, um, with the differentiated instruction. They've got to have that enrichment. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and that, to what, speaking to that, that's another thing that came through on the survey is feeling like kids aren't prepared uh, for college and they need more. Like that came through on their, their written comments as well. So mm -hmm. I think really, um, nailing down like distinction between you know moving forward i think a lot of work has been done in this area i think that's fair to say more work needs to be done um and maybe even a plan for how to move forward not just and i know a, a more specific plan on how to move forward as far as communication and understanding and the work that's being done within the buildings for the grading uh, commitments as well. I think it's just important that that work gets done and realizing that everyone's goal is to make sure our kids are ready post high school. I think that's everyone's goal. And I think that gets left out on that conversation, making sure they are prepared, whatever they plan to do, go to work, go in the military, go to post high school, um, university colleges. I think, um, we all lose, we get caught up in the conversation and we lose fact that everybody's goal is to get our kids prepared for post high school. I think that gets lost in the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also a misconception that students don't have consequences when they don't turn work in and that and when they don't do it on time and that hasn't changed. If they don't turn the work in, they receive an M, which counts as a zero, and they have a failing grade until they turn it in. Right. And so I think that's why you're not seeing a dramatic shift in the number of Fs, because those students, while they weren't developing those skills when we didn't have these commitments, they're still struggling to develop those responsibility skills, and we have more work to do there. And that's where I would call out to families to partner with us in that. It's not teachers alone that teach those no. skills of responsibility and timeliness. That's a partnership with families too, in improving those and holding students accountable and continuing to have the conversations and track improvements in those areas and things like that. So um, those same students continue to struggle with timeliness and responsibility and we continue to work on those skills and habits with those students yeah and i think ruby too something to enter in that conversation on that same line is the kiddos who are struggling making sure we have the supports in place and hopefully uh make as they as they improve or advance in their grades mm -hmm. like not their abc grades but their six seven eight nine whatever skills they're missing um, for whatever reason that we're putting those supports in place mm -hmm. so and not just like another percent we just keep passing them on mm -hmm. um, but making sure we're putting those supports in place at the right time so they can continue to advance and and develop their learning as well i think that's mm -hmm. um important conversation as part of that absolutely Right. So like if they're if we're doing algebra one in eighth grade and yet we're moving them to geometry as a freshman, but they're not quite ready for that. How are we putting those supports in place? Mm -hmm. What are we offering those kiddos that aren't ready for that next level? That has to be part of that conversation mm -hmm. as yeah. well. Yeah. So I think the goal, you know, I think everyone's working towards this goal and maybe just more attention to it or a different plan. Well, I think they're working on it. I think yeah. the onus on the board is, I mean, one, help with communication has been said multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I think two, give the staff the space to make these, like they're working hard on it. Mm -hmm. Let's give them the space yeah. to do it. You know? And communicating what they are doing. I think Definitely. it's the lack of the communication. Yeah. 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 And also including the students in that, right? Like that student perception is important. If they don't feel like they're getting prepared for college, right. that's an issue. Yeah. Right. Because that's where some of them feel that they're going. So um, again, that goes back to our building and the grading commitment. Yeah. Is Mary planning on continuing those conversations through her committee? The parent committee yeah. that we formed last fall. Yep. She is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've passed along the members of that committee, and I think. Um, I think a good thing would be for me to support her with that too. And since I have been involved in the fall in that committee and just um, 
helping to organize that and making sure that happened. And now if I'm at a full-time capacity now, I had, would have the ability to do that. And maybe hearing from that committee, Ruby, going backwards on how we can help this board would be better than us pushing, right? Like mm -hmm. as they're making decisions, floating that up so we can help uh, be informed as board members and we're out talking to community members, we are better informed as well as what that committee's doing. Yeah, absolutely. Right, going yeah. that direction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does that help with that? Everybody agree on that? Yeah, All right. Good. Um, restorative practices, I want to jump back to that, Ruby, because you had to leave the room for a moment. I know Mary was our coordinator for that. Um, mm -hmm. Now that she's moved to high school principals, can you speak to what is happening with restorative practices? Yeah. Um, so Mary, originally when we brought Mary on as the restorative practices coordinator, the, the long-term plan was a training plan for our teachers so that all of our staff in the district would be trained in restorative practices. And Mary's role as the coordinator was a lot of that training for staff. So every year she would train our new teachers during induction in restorative practices. And the first couple of years, she did some heavy training in all the buildings on restorative practices and what that looks like and how to lead those conversations. And um, the goal was to build the capacity of all of our employees so that we're a restorative practices district in general, our principals, our teachers, our counselors, our paraprofessionals, everybody. Another thing she was doing in that position was she was putting together and holding restorative meetings. So when there was a conflict to restore the harm that was done, she would, the practice looked something like this, contact the victim and their families, contact the um, perpetrator and their families, I'm using that word, but I can't think of a different one. <laughs> um, and then make sure all are agreeable to sitting because we would never force anyone into a restorative conversation. Both parties need to agree. And then leading that conversation about what harm was done, how we're restoring it, and what our action plan is to move forward and make things better. So that's kind of an overview. She was leading those on our on some of the biggest conflicts in our district between staff members or between students and their teachers, between administrators and staff members, whatever it was. So she's been taken out of that role. There are a large number of staff members that have had some intensive training and restorative practices. So we call on those staff members that have been highly trained in restorative practices to fill in that gap that Mary was doing right now because we didn't replace that position. Another thing that we actually, this is, I'm kind of talking about <laughs> the superintendent goals because this is in there. Um, another thing is we, we are just embedding mandatory restorative practices training refresher every year for all teachers because one of the gaps we've noticed is we teachers have been trained but it might have been three years ago and when you you may get out of practice or fall out of practice so we're making that part of our mandatory training for the upcoming school years every year because what we've been doing is training all the new teachers on like a half day intensive but then we're not like refreshing all of our veteran teachers. So we need to do a little better in that training. So that's what it looks like right now. Are you seeing that training like in their August when the teachers come back or are yeah. you seeing that throughout the school year? Well, it does happen throughout the school year because Mary pops in the staff meetings quite often. Okay. And we'll, we'll do a refresher or Sonia or some of our counselors, some of those other staff members that have been highly trained. Um, so, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's where we're at right now with Mary moving into the high school principal position and continuing our restorative work. We also partner with restorative justice for support there. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. So we have a lot of community, community members highly trained in restorative practices, which now that we can invite them back into our schools without restrictions, we have that community resource that we can rely on to lead those restorative meetings for us, which is great, which we do now. Um, so now that Mary's not in that position leading those meetings, we can call on our community members for support there to lead those meetings for us. Okay, any questions on restorative or? Uh, communication strategies, training or book study. I don't think that we did a book study. And how will we monitor ourselves to make sure we complete this goal? Eric was the point person on that. 
I'm mean, ongoing. I think just us revisiting, keep revisiting our goals yeah. is a good monitor. I don't know if Eric had more to add to that, but we can um, just chat with him to see if he had any more to add to that. New learning topics. Um, Esther has been crushed off. Policy 101. Uh, we did not bring in, that is something that we could ask for CASB if we feel like we want a policy 101. That's the service actually CASB offers through Matt Cook. We could invite him up um, to talk about policy if we wish to do that. That would be a suggestion. Um, work session February. We did have Culture Bump came February 8th and met with the board. We also had on March 8th, uh, Sherry Wrench came and talked to, uh, from CASB working together as a board. Plus, she briefly went over with us the mission, vision, and belief discussion. We had that. Um, I don't know that I have noted any other learning topics that we have done. The lawyer came up and spoke. Yep. Um, culture bump about. Um, yep, February 8th. Yeah. She covered a lot. <laughs> she covered <laughs> like, a lot of ground. I even point what specifically that was a topic. So, yeah. So any other ones to add to that? Uh, communication, any, anything else for We Are Learners on number one? Mm -hmm. All right, communication, intentional two-way communication, um, develop a specific community outreach engagement plan, Minimum of uh, six community outreach pieces from board utilizing various communication methods, including email, newsletter, social media posts, press, release letters to editor, podcast, snail mail, et cetera. Um, pair outreach pieces with the Board of Education, Mary Berry with restorative practices. Jason, I think, and the green the upcoming was November middle school math. Well, let's go back to restorative. I think restorative, we covered that with what Mary. Um, and I've done two. I've done, I did a math one and I did one on the elementary school. So. That went out to community members. Yep. So math for the middle school, Jason. Yep, I did that. And what was your elementary school one? It was on when, um, I wrote one on when, uh, they got a priority approval. Okay. It went out from Ruby and Sheldon. But I wrote it. <laughs> with help, as I always do with writing. On restorative practices, do we have a communication regarding that in the, uh, December? I don't think that got done. Um, end of year wrap, we have not done, well, we're, at, we're kind of towards the end of year, but we have not completed that. So that'll be a to-do. Um, global outcomes. Perspective on the process we use to get where we are with them, how they're used, except different levels. I think Ruby's going to give an update on global outcomes later. That's in, in the superintendent today. goals. Yeah. Yep. Neighborhood learning conversations surrounding the global outcomes. Yeah. So we had we had developed a way to go like a deep dive in each of the global outcomes, like following a series of like community conversations on each of the individual global outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, that was designed to roll out in March of 2020. Um, and then COVID came. So we put that on hold and we've been waiting to see. It's the end of school year, so nothing's gonna happen now. We can discuss that next year and decide if that's something we wanna do in conjunction with superintendent. So I say we just table that for now. I agree, Jason, because the neighborhood learning communities with COVID has just been such a challenge and yeah. people are at different levels. Right. Um, so I agree with that. Yeah, we put save for the spring or save to check in because COVID's mm -hmm. evolving. And that includes, going, and I think part of that is, or part of the whole conversation, what else can we or should we do together and put from stakeholders? Um, again, the big one I see in here is the community feedback, and I think that'll help with the um, NLCs as well if we plan to move forward with that. Yeah. It's a yeah. great way. Definitely. I mean, we're in the school year, so I think yeah, we, it's all tied get, we survive, hopefully, and then 
we can really plan next year well. And then the weekly column with the trope is that we never invoke that um, with these schools. I think that can be part as we move forward with the new superintendent. I think that would be great to get an idea on how that communication piece and how we yeah. want to approach that. Just what that was is the Trail Gazette talked to the board or the board members saying like, we'll publish, if you write something, we'll publish it. Right. And the district employees are so busy running the district, we thought a way the board could help is by writing up some pieces for the Trail Gazette. Um, so same, yeah. So I think we could just keep that in the back of our mind that if we write it, most likely they'll publish it. We meaning the, the so board. I'm here to identify Sheldon and Heather. Are you thinking? No, well, let's see here. This says Sheldon and Heather, not we the board. When well, they, the ahead. idea was that the board would be writing them and then Sheldon and I would turn them in for you guys. Yes. Yeah. That's why it's part of the board goals. They got to proofread, make sure. I don't make a bunch of mistakes. Usually when you see my name, it's because I'm gonna be proofreading it and then passing it on. <laughs> so how do, so uh, just curious, I mean we'll like we'll have to continue that idea. How do you foresee the um, topics coming up? So if you're having the board write them, how are you foreseeing generating the topics for those articles? I think they should be in board purview. And so like, for example, like I watched some of the stuff going on with middle school math and I talked to teachers and students and then put that together, and wrote it. And then I gave it to Heather to send to the trail for that. And so if we go to a community event, if we're, you know, watching something or if we want to try, you know, I think even with some of the grading stuff, like we put something out and we thought it'd be helpful for the board wrote something too. So we wrote something to support it. So I think, the stuff that's in our purview we can do and so keep it flexible as opposed yeah. to have a schedule yeah and you know current events like yeah and you know like i was excited to do math and i was excited to do um you know some of the grading stuff but there's some if there's a big writing thing i probably wouldn't be excited to do it but maybe ava would or something like that so uh you know <laughs> we we could do what we're excited for yeah okay um sr 3 strategy consultant was there a discussion to like since i've been on the board i was not aware that was there a discussion to hire a consultant so you guys are gonna date me i feel like i don't know about this so <laughs> well i definitely I don't know it was a really <laughs> great conversation i think i mean i know sheldon talked about what to do with sr funds but i don't know about a consultant so I don't, know, I don't know what to do about is this. Is the question a consultant specifically for SR3 reporting or SR3? I, I don't know. It just oh, says okay. uh, SR3 strategy consultant. That's all it states. Yeah. So I'm not certain. And then the very next thing is starting this conversation with DAC in mid October and then working on a survey. I know a survey was sent out. Yeah. I know the results were shared. Right. But I, since my tenure on the board, I have not had any discussions regarding hiring a consultant. Yeah. So I don't. I say we cross it off or something. Cross that one off. <laughs> I've not been part of any of those yeah. discussions, but the way the sentence reads makes me think that maybe there was some looking into a consultant to help us with the reporting requirements for SR3. That's what I'm wondering. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. Ryan, be familiar at all with that information he's coming in isn't it mm -hmm. we can ask him we can ask in. him okay. in the meantime i don't hear any conversation <laughs> on hiring a consultant so i'm with jason cross that one off yeah, yeah. okay um let's see working we did have a survey that went out in december mm -hmm. so that happened um the nlcs again we'll go back to that uh, I think when we can, as we move forward with new goals for the upcoming year, I think we can have a discussion on the NLCs and different a variety of topics. I think right. just moving forward. Right. Would you agree with that? Yep. Yeah. Um, so going back, I just want to clarify for the record, we a survey was sent about the ESSER three funds. Um, it was published, it was discussed in DAC, it was discussed in our board meetings. 
And I know there it was on our website for a period of time as well. I think moving forward, I would like to see, like I've been looking at other uh, districts and I would like to see clarity on where we are as far as what, what we have utilized the funds on. I think that's probably going back to closing that feedback loop. Uh -huh. You know, we got X amount of dollars as a district for Esther 3. This is what we've utilized the funding for. This is what we have um, remaining. Right. As far Esther as those three funds. ones, we have a few years to spend those. Two, yeah, 24. 24. 24. This is 24. So I think a clear picture so we can communicate it accurately to our community what we have utilized, um, what positions, if you will, that we have used those fundings for, and then how much we have remaining in our an actual plan for moving forward for use of those funds, I think would be a great um, communication piece with our community. Because I get asked a lot about that. Can we buy this? Can we do that? So I think if we could communicate what we've utilized clearly, what we have remaining, and where we want to go with those funds is a great communication piece with our community. And designating because there are there there's specific things that those funds can be used for, and I don't know if the public really understands yeah. the details of you know these are limited to these specific areas. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. That's all on that. Well, good. All right. Um, diversity. Actually, oh. before we go into diversity, yeah. I, oh, I, I, I have a couple of topics on communication I wanted to check in on. Yes, sorry Russia. about that, Jason. No Not problem. Intentional. I didn't take it. It went on the left, so I just kept going. I don't Can I also ask, when you guys are talking about that as a board goal, does that mean you're you're making the communication? Yes. Or should we be making the communication? No, you have your okay. own. Well, okay. I mean, whatever. Sheldon had his communication goals. These goals are for us. Okay. So. It gets confusing in that aspect. So that was a really good question. Yeah. If I can just say that, because a lot of times when we were checking in on goals, it was crossing over and I was like, no, that one was yours. Right. I did yeah. this one, but we want yes. them to like, to work we're together, like right. run parallel almost yeah. so yeah. that it's a consistent message for the communication. Um, but it's, a, it, we've heard that it's extremely important that people want to hear from the board. Right. So. I would think that whoever is going to take the reins on that communication, you would need to sit down with probably Brian and I to know what we spent it on right. and what yes. we have left. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I see that kind of flowing up as, as opposed to a push down on that communication, because I think it's important that whatever the board communicates, first spot is it has to be discussed in a board meeting. Right. Right. Like the information I think needs to be covered in a board meeting and go that direction. I don't think we can just go off and start communicating um, information without ha having speaking with you, Brian, a building principal, whatever that topic is. I think we have to go back to the source. Yeah. Uh, and I know for all public communication that I did, like I'd send a draft to like superintendent and Heather and then they normally the ones to send it out, not me. Yeah. And so to make sure I'm consistent with what the district is saying mm -hmm. and correct. Okay. But I'm okay. Yeah. So that may, going back to communication piece. So if you're writing it, but at the same time, we're saying the community wants to hear from the board, but you're not signing it, then are we meeting that piece of what I'm hearing that the community wants? Because if you're writing it, but yet Heather, or someone else is sending it well, out. It's safe from me. They okay. just, they just, so I send it from. So let's say I write a piece on uh, middle school math. This is what they're doing. This is what I've seen. Here's some examples, stuff like that. And then I write it and, you know, I send a draft to the board and, well, Heather does. So I send to Heather. Heather and superintendent look it over. Then they send a draft to the board. They give feedback to Heather. Was, Heather's really the point person. Right. Um, and, I'll, and then we'll get a final draft, and then Heather sends it out to communication work, you know, to Trevor's ad or the, you know, the emails and stuff like that. As as, as Jamie, with your name yeah. signed, right? Yeah, gotcha. So I have a sender set up for every board member and the board of the whole, and right. so I have the ability to do that. Right, and I, I think it's good that way. Yeah, I think it's better than us, like you're saying, we should be doing our own thing, all crazy. Right. 
I agree. Okay, good. And then the communication plan, you want to talk about that more, Jason? Yes, I have two things under, two communication things I want to talk about. They weren't our list and our goals, but we have some great segues because we have talked about communication a lot, even in this meeting, mm -hmm. uh, around our grading practices, around budget stuff, and, 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 and my personal feeling, but actually my opinion is, I think the state should provide like marketing or communication people for schools because it's imperative we have good communication as we all know, right? And, uh, and I've seen like in the district I work in Vermont, their budget gets slashed because they changed their school mascot. You know, and that's a communication issue. Um, and so I feel like given at the administrator level, we are short staff right now. And Heather, who's our main communication person, is also supporting Ruby and Carmen. Uh, and I feel like where we are with our community right now, like we're getting a lot of people at board meetings, I think communication is paramount. Um, so I feel like it would be worthwhile for us to get a professional in communication, like support. And I think it could be temporary. I don't know what it means forever, but someone who does education communication to help support us with communication right now, because there's a lot going on. We're short staff. And I think it's important, uh, you know, with this transition to a new superintendent and all that we have going on, that we have professional help. I mean, it definitely feels beyond what I can do. And I feel like, you know, I know we're being watched budget wise right now, but I think like S or three funds or something, it comes from something like that. I think what I heard is they can come from that money. So it's not like affecting teacher salaries or anything like that. But I think it would help. And then once we got someone good, our communication person can take some of those practices and continue it. Are so. you speaking of a consultant or part-time position? I was thinking consultant. Um, and I know, um, well, so Sheldon had been researching this, and I know he got a quote from David Gregory, or that was in the process, and then someone else. And I know Stacy says she uh, heard of a district, I can't remember which one, that had some good communication people. So, uh, you know, I don't have like a one that I want. I just think I'd like someone good to help us with it, because I think it could make a big difference with what we have going on right now. And most larger school districts do have a communication director. Yeah. That is a full-time position. Yeah. And a person like that is in touch with what's happening in the district because they're there mm -hmm. for communication pieces. Mm -hmm. A consultant is different in that it um, gives ideas for being a better communicator from the district and within the district and outside of the district. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know which would be better. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the funding as far as budget. Um, I know that we're stretched thin with everybody and what they're doing right. and we are you know short a staff member so i don't know what yeah. where does that just where does how does that proceed yeah with, i mean i think i mean it would be wonderful to have a communication part or full-time at the district I don't even know if it needs to be full-time maybe right part -time. maybe part-time i'm just not sure what that would look like budget-wise right and I feel like we kind of need help now. So, but I mean, I'm open. It would be useful. We could use it. So where are we at? Yeah. From, you know, what does that look like? And I mean, Eric's not here. Right. So mm -hmm. anyone else have thoughts? Um, I, like I have the latest that uh, David Gregory gave us mm -hmm. on the quote. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, like, we could piece, my understanding is we could piece mill everything together. The bottom line for everything that was outlined for him to provide at that time was $42,000. Right. So I don't know if, um, and it's a discount, there's a discounted rate at 39600 Right. So I think we, A, need to have it as a board discussion where we can take action because we cannot today. We can have a discussion. Um, 
but is is that consulting firm passing the buck to the people currently on staff to do all these things on this checklist to make their workload more? Well, and also I wonder, like I'm concerned about that. Right? Yeah, I'm concerned yeah. about that too. And I'm not even sure I, as a board member could make that decision. And so, I mean, well, I have two thoughts. One, like Stacy's talking about we pass a motion. I don't, we can do that, but I don't know if that's the route we have to go. Like right now, Ruby, you're our acting superintendent. Mm -hmm. And so you know best. So one, I'm curious your thoughts about do you want this? Do you want us like mm -hmm. maybe the future down the road? And then if you want it, like, do you want now? Do you want to wait? Like, what, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are it's needed. And yes, I would love the extra support with communication and I think it's needed. I'm always going to ask for extra support at the district <laughs> office. So if you're going to ask me that, just know the answer is going to be yes more. Uh -huh. But um, so I know that I kind of wonder if that element about SR3 funding for consultants was actually this and that mm. we were looking into. It. I know that I have a, a Zoom meeting with CEI on Thursday, which Sheldon had already reached out to about strategic planning. And I know the David Gregory thing was also strategic planning, but CEI also will do communication plans for schools too. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to them on Thursday about that in addition to the strategic planning support they could give us. Um, I really like what Ava brings up about if we bring on a consultant for a year to help us with our own professional learning, it's still the same staff we currently have that's doing all of that communication. And so I think I'd like to diagnose the problem of, is it that we need more professional development or is it that we need more staff to, because we need the capacity to communicate? I think once we know that, then we can probably make a decision. <laughs> I think, you know, um, but right, then that, but that also results. begs the question on my behalf of, do are we still wanting to look into consultants to help us with strategic planning in the years to come too? Mm -hmm. So should we continue to look? I know that's different from communication, but since right. some of the companies we are looking at provide us support in both areas, maybe, and it might be a, Yes, and it might be both that we need right. for the first year. Um, I don't know. I think I'd like to ask a lot of, of our people who are doing communication for our district right now, because there's a lot of people that do. Me, the instructional coaches, the office staff, Heather, like all of us have pieces. Um, and as I'm talking, I'm already diagnosing one of the problems is like communicating <laughs> those people communicating with each other and streamlining how we communicate and what that looks like and what our templates look like and how often the communications go out and all of those things, right? Um, so I know I said a lot there, but the well, answer is yes, we need. Support. Yeah, well, so here's what I wonder, because this is where we're in a little more complicated situation. So historically on something like this, like superintendent would say like, well, what do you guys think about getting communication help? And the boards would, might say like, yeah, I think we do more communication. And then the superintendent would handle it and either just do it or say, here's three proposals, what do you think? But it, was, it doesn't have to be like a pass the motion just to make sure mm -hmm. we're working in alignment. So we would say right now, let's say it was Sheldon, we'd say, Sheldon, like, why don't you get us some proposals or some ideas? And he'd say, here's the two or three, what do you think? And we'd say the best one. But now, like, I, I don't want to dump that on you if you don't want it. What should we do? What should we you do? I'm I guess I'm grappling with that mm -hmm. question. Um, like, would it be helpful if we made a decision, like in the next meeting? Like, yes, we want to spend get a consultant for at least a couple months to help us, or mm -hmm. let's just stay as we are for a few months and then figure out once the dust settles. That's what I'm grappling with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that um, that Ruby talking with CEI. <laughs> is a good starting point. Um, we are still in the process of securing a superintendent with a one-year contract. Uh -huh. So um, that we've got two months, you know, a month and a half before July. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's the middle of May. 
Yeah. So I think that maybe, you know, Ruby getting that information is important, um, sharing that with us, and then waiting until July 1 to start the serious discussion and making decisions for the short term might be a good direction because we when do we meet i mean we can't make decisions until i just i just think we need more information before we start making decisions so maybe our for our august meeting and identify what we want I mean, we can we can bring a consultant in for communication, and we can that's that's the easy part, right? And right. Hiring a consultant is the easy part. Yeah. It's us identifying what we want of that. I don't feel like we've sat down and identified that criteria. Exactly. The specifics okay. of what we want. I agree, but right? I, I, like we can bring them in. Okay, we need help with communication. I think their very first question is, "Well, what do you mean?" Right. And I don't know that we've had that discussion to identify what do we want of that person. I would maybe propose that we bring in some of these different consulting companies to tell us what they provide for districts. Right. And then once we know what they can provide for districts, maybe that will help guide us. Like perhaps if I meet with CEI and ask what they provide districts for communication in addition to the strategic planning part and David Gregory as well. And if there's any others we wanna look at, maybe we can invite them into our next work session to share what they can provide um, so we understand what they, how they help districts with communication. Right. And then maybe we can identify if we actually have the people on staff to do the training with them, to do the meeting with them. Or if we don't, then that's a different discussion about do we need to add a part-time person or exactly. what do we need to do? Because we need to be very wise with our resources, um, with the communication and looking at short-term with the consultant versus us, and I'm not saying this, I've already decided, versus long-term with a part-time person to handle that so that it's not adding more to the job description. Mm -hmm. I think that's everybody. A, I think that's a great distinction. I think where we all agree is the need is there. And yeah. in all the conversations we've had throughout this whole semester, we keep coming back to communication as one of our major improvement areas like we keep yes. we we have talked about that and i think every meeting i participated in yeah. with you so i think we all agree that communication is going to be one of our major areas of focus and we need support in it Great. i think those things i mean that was the main thing i want to answer like are we exploring putting some resources there with research because i don't want mm -hmm. to have like ruby go to these meetings if we're gonna so is it possible to bring in the consultants for the june work session is that I'll ask to CEI on Thursday and I can contact David Gregory. Well, we can, well, before we start deciding that, we've got agenda planning because I think we got to look and see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We need to have that at the agenda planning section, not right now. Okay. And, and I do want to take it with John. I haven't heard anything from John. Yeah. yeah. I'm still there. Mm -hmm. Nope. You're all making great Sorry. points. And uh, basically, yeah, it's hard to make a decision unless you have options set in front of you you can look at the pros and cons and sometimes a pro and pro or con or pros might outweigh things doing nothing and just going with your own resources so you know there's a cost to any way we go so we're going to look and see you know which cost do we want to assume great thank you so what i hear is i think we're interested in more resources towards communication mm -hmm. and now we need to figure out how that and the timeline for presenting of course yeah, yeah. you mm -hmm. know and so great thank you guys well and i think and i just want to stress too going back to what ruby said is where is the communication need at is it we need it more within or do we need someone to come in i think that's a really important distinction i agree mm -hmm. and i think that's where ruby now as i can superintendent can help us start identifying those needs yeah because it goes back to we got to identify our needs before we hire a consultant to solve our needs. Yeah. yeah. We, we can't solve, you know, we can bring in a consultant, but if we can't identify where our needs are, then that's an issue. So I think we got to start with that. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Do you guys feel complete with that conversation? Yeah, do you? I do.
and I appreciate it. Uh, I did have because it's important. Yeah, it is. I, I agree. I think it's super important. Uh, so I had one other thing I wanted to bring up. Um, as in emails and at the last regular board meeting, we got a lot of questions to the board. Um, and and also I got uh, I think we all got it. Tony's email, Tony Breezy's email about like we want to answer these questions. I, I emailed her back and said like. We haven't met since then. <laughs> okay, so Jason, I'm gonna stop then okay. because that's gonna be a total different topic. Uh -huh. I think we gotta finish with our, our board goals. Can we, let's finish this conversation. That's fine. Okay. Right, that's and then fine. we can talk about that as well. But for our agenda here, I think we gotta stay on our board goals. Oh, okay. Well, that's why I asked to distinct from communication. Yeah. So you let, Does that let make me know sense? It's, yeah, it's fine. Because that's kind of like a whole different, uh, area of responding to our, our emails. Is that right. where you're going with that? Right. Uh, well, I, I'll just lay, say what I was thinking. You can tell me, you can decide where it fits best. We were asked a whole bunch of questions in various forms and stuff like yeah. that, but there's some pretty common, I think, themes to them. Yeah. And I want to discuss, do we want to answer those questions? That's the discussion I want to have. So I think that doesn't belong in our board goals discussion, but I great. do think that's an important discussion. Okay, great. That we need to bring up. It's just not on our agenda right now. Great. Does that make sense? Yeah. I agree with you on yeah. that as well. And that actually tying that back into is tying it back into the communication plan overall moving forward, mm -hmm. addressing the emails. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important part of that conversation okay. overall. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, moving to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, the district should be a safe and welcoming environment for every family, student, staff, and community member. How can we help ensure that this is true? Identify process for working to diversify the narrative. Include a student voice, um, upcoming. I think something that we have done with that is our student board reps. Um, I have been talking, I've brought it up numerous times. I, Moving forward, I don't know how those student board reps were identified for being on attending our board meetings, but including um, a reflective voice of our student body, I would like to see moving forward. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how they were selected either. I think they were selected by principal. Okay. So that just that was my thought is having a student voice from our diverse population would be a great way mm -hmm. to help address this. I agree. Issue. Um, make community engagement a priority. I think that goes back to us being able, post COVID going out and talking to our EL families or Spanish speaking families, um, I kind of do that normally or just an everyday event for me. Um, but I just think making that more purposeful, more intentional would be great. And making sure we're including um, our Spanish speaking families in our uh, district outreach discussions. I think that would be important. Mm -hmm. um, of course, understanding this will take time. I don't know <laughs> why that kind of is in there. I'm not sure either, but we know it. Yeah, we know it. So I'm, not, I'm not sure why that was really in there. Um, include education on policy governance. I'm not, I have a notation on that. I'm not sure why that is there as well. Sure policy that. governance how, is how our board runs. So why that was included in this goal. Jason, can you speak to that? I wasn't around when this document was created. Uh, the include education on policy governance? Yeah, why is that under diversity, equity, and inclusion? Mm, I'm not sure. To me, I think that needs to be moved yeah. um, over to We Are Learners. Sure, or we can just strike it. Okay. I think we've covered it quite a bit in We Are Learners, you know. Right? Maybe it was just one extra. And that goes back to, we can actually move that, um, or. You know, of course, a lot of new goals, but we can talk about that when we establish new goals for the next year. Um, making that going back to the policy and having Matt Casby come up, we can always do that. Um, reach out to state and national groups for support. I don't know if anyone has done that. I don't think so. Things have been kind of crazy. I think it's a good idea, though, because a lot of people are doing good work around this. I think we could learn some. So. Well, and there's a lot. I think Ruby, you're the one, or someone's told me about the amount of information on the CDE's website. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think you might have been the one that mentioned that to me. Yeah. So I went out and took, there is a lot of information out there, even on CDE's mm -hmm. website that we can pull from. I'm going to go back to um, understand that this will take time. 
think if we're intentional about doing that, then time is not a factor. If it's on our goal, we should be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So does that need to be on there? It doesn't matter. I mean, well, it's on this set of goals. So what was the, was there a thought behind I that? mean, sometimes with these things, like, bunch of people say stuff. Uh, I would say we all agree on it, but someone says like, we need to understand this will take time. I'm not gonna disagree with so that. Just it's fine with it down there. Just put on. It's, right. it's not like a specific measurable result, you know? Okay. So, I don't know, I'm, I agree it'll take time. I don't care if it's on there or not, so. Okay. Well, and it's on here. I mean, we don't, we're, just we're not, we're just reviewing it, so. Yeah. I'm updating this in real time while you guys are talking, yeah. just so you And I didn't it. understand what that meant. <laughs> I knew you figured right. it was, but I just wanted to make sure you knew. You know, the previous board yeah. chair, and I, I, I just, I don't know. Yeah. I, w I need clarification about that. <laughs> Fine, but I, I mean, someone said that I got written down, uh, so. Am I striking it because it's a given? Well, I'd hate to strike it uh, just because if we strike it, it takes it off the record that it ever was on there. I mean, leave it on. Like, yeah, this, just leave it on. This doc leave it document is, is relevant for one more month. Yeah. And then okay. exactly. Renew, so. Then we'll re review it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, a, a notation next to include education or policy governance, maybe that is. Um, Review and look at a few. Uh, review and look at put it under our rear learners section. Yeah. Just start so we can identify what we're doing with it. Um, DEI updates from admin team work with Alex through the fall to plan for the next steps. I have never heard of any update on that happening because there's a few sections on so here. Alex, so I would say the Alex thing. There's uh, two of them on here. Right. We've, Actually, there's three. Uh, I'll I'll explain that. That actually is significant. Well, what it is, is so when, so just a little bit of history, like at one point the board, this is back when like Cody Walker was president of the board a while ago, uh, the board requested a gap group study from Sheldon, which Sheldon, so Sheldon could then get our analysis and see where our gap groups are and our equity issues were, and then we could address it. So then we started a plan and started working on it. And then, as many of you know, like there's a big national conversation about equity to make sure we're serving all students, which is super important. And there's a lot of resources for teachers and I think for principals and I think for superintendents around equity. There's actually not a lot of resources for boards around equity. We can support the work that you're doing, but I was really grappling. And I, and I talked to Sherry Renchik Hasby, but she came up here for a visit. I'm like, I think the boards do equity work too, but I can't find anyone doing that. And she's like, it's a big missing. She's like, I'm grappling with that too. And, and CASB went on their first, I think the, one of their CASB thing during COVID was, had a lot about equity stuff. So uh, my wife does educational professional development and is connected. So I'm like, can you find anyone who does like equity work with boards, not with teachers and, and that sort of stuff. And so we found this guy, Alex Fralin. And he did like an introductory session with uh, our board. And I think he also did a group with administrators. Um, others, yes? I thought we did. No? no? We never did with the principals. I know it was talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it happened. Oh, we, we might have scheduled it. And I set in on yours. Right. But the principals sent it. Okay. okay. So he is someone, he's like out of uh, Minnesota or something like that but he has worked with a couple school boards and I thought he was really good. And he did an initial session with our board that I think people found helpful. And we talked about following up with him and then things got crazy, COVID came and it, it never happened. Um, and when he worked with us, um, it was virtual. He was, uh, it was, it was Zoom. We, I mean, we were together and I think he was Zooming in. And so, the, the question with him, or what that is about, is do we as a board want to work on how we as a board can do equity, not just tell the superintendent to do it? Um, and he's a consultant uh, who does that, who I thought did a good job. And so do we want that? Do we want to try and find someone else or, or not do it? I think that's the question to us. Does that make sense? 
Yep. So on the three that's on here, equity reports, um, discipline, discipline equity review, financial equity audit, um, working with Alex, he was not brought in to speak to the board is what I'm understanding. So, Cause uh, then there's training on here spring of 2022. Right. A he book was not study. So none of that was completed. None of that was completed. We had talked about it. Um, we had talked about it in the fall and then, uh, we thought like, well, we're gonna have a new board soon. Why, you know, if we end up having three new board members, why have to do a work session with three old board members that are gonna go out? Just, it's just not a good use of resources. And so, so, but then as you all know, we've been very busy. So, so I think the question is us, to us would be, uh, would we like something like that? And it probably wouldn't be till next fall. I mean, we do whenever, but I feel like we have a pretty busy spring right now, so. Um, so Jason on here, it says uh, book article study. Did you ever get a book from him to do a book study no. on? No. So the board talked about, Hey, if we're just going to keep doing our work, we should like, we should do a book study. Um, and they said, we should get a recommendation from Alex because he seemed really knowledgeable, but we never did that. So that, that goal is not complete and probably won't be this year. So that goal can be, um, move forward to next year's if we want and maybe go ahead and speak to Alex about a possible book study a yeah. book to be used as a book study I mean I, I, I that mean, would be setting on the new goals exactly for yeah. this goal update it's the um for multiple reasons we didn't get Alex in here it right. sounds like the start of it was during the COVID right. era so Right. So I would say, I mean, we're just not going to, I think it's best just not to meet these goals. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and then address it going forward. How do we want to address it going and forward? And then I think when we create our goals for next year, is diversity, equity, inclusion one of our goals? And if so, what's our plan? Like, I think it's worthwhile to have someone to come in and help. It's a tricky thing. So I think it's worthwhile, but I think we need to discuss that as a board. Yeah. Yep. And then we can create our plan. If we want it, what do we want to do? Right. Yeah. Because this is, I mean, just remind everybody, this is an update of this goal, not setting next year's goals. Right. So for the update for today is we were not, we did not bring Alex in. We did not do a book study. And then we need clearly for all of our goals, we'll need to readdress how, or if we want this to continue to be a goal and what does that look like in the next set of goals? Yes. Right. Right? Is that yeah. fair? Yes. Okay. I mean, and, and just, I want to acknowledge, like, it's a tricky situation. These goals were created by previous board. We had a transition. And with a the transition, there's just a lot of change. And exactly. so these goals are, it's kind of a, a weird fit. It is, but I think it's important that we still identify, like, what's been, what's been done. Yeah. Because six months of these goals have been done. Right. So I think we really need to make sure we acknowledge that. Yeah. In the document. And then, um, Reevaluate and then take this maybe as the standing document moving forward for yeah. future right. board goals. Yeah. So that's why I was trying to figure out between when this was created and December, what of this has been done. Because right. I recognize we did not have Alex come, we did not do a book study, right. but what of these goals were done up to that time frame? Right. That's why I was trying to figure out so we can have that properly documented. Great. Um, and then equity reports, we did not, um, for discipline and financial equity audit, I don't, we did not get a report on those. Correct. And just a little background on those in brainstorming, it's interesting to think about like, what is in a board's purview as far as working around equity? Cause a lot of it falls to superintendent and right. administrators and staff and Alex said, like, these are two things that you guys can ask for these reports and then see, like, how is your district doing? So, but we have not, we didn't do those reports. And I think it's worth mentioning, even though it's not a board goal, there was staffing added to support our young Definitely. population. I think that's really important. Right. And a big part of uh, our, our, our board supporting diversity and inclusion is, is supporting you know, the staff are doing what they need yep. to do, yep. you know. And make sure we're providing funding for those positions. Yes. I think that's important. Yeah. 
So that I see that as the board side of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's been like our, I sound like our liaisons are invaluable. Okay, any more in number three or we can go to number four? I'm good. All right, John, anything with three? Nope, I'm good. All right. Uh, number four, le learner centered. Students are at the center of our work, improving learning outcomes, especially at the elementary school and for gap groups in all three schools is a priority. Um, boards will remain aware of the work being done by requesting and reviewing evidence and reports to stay informed. We have a green update on the accountability measures this year UIP, SIP, um, district UIP updates, elementary, middle, high, this whole section, uh, direct student services. So going backwards, update my accountability measures for this year ongoing. Um, UIP, SIP updates. I don't know that we have added as a board, we did our mid-year update, but I, that did not specifically relate to our UIPs, I think, well, our SIPs for middle and high school. Did that happen prior to? Well, it did happen prior to, though I believe they mentioned it. I know middle school mentioned it in their presentation of their data after the Sherry Wrench thing. So, and I, and Mary, I don't know if Mary mentioned this. I know Janet definitely mentioned her, uh, her plan. Her plans. Yeah. So, so I think that, you know, we got that update and I don't know that Mary mentioned it, but I think she covered a lot of the stuff in it. So I'm not quite sure how to, how to mark that. I, I probably think towards marketing is done because I feel like unless and then unless you want to plan some more detail, but I feel like I feel like they mentioned them in that mid-year update. So I think we can uh, say let's say that we got mid-year updates. Okay. I think that is fair, and we can put a date on that. Um, when was our mid-years? I don't think it was until your March work session. Yeah, That's March, yeah. March 8th. Mm -hmm. It was March 8th. So I think we can put uh, receive mid year updates in March 8th for um, actually all three schools. Yeah. And then we can, again, moving forward, look at if we want to change how that looks or change how that reporting looks. Okay. Um, we can do that in our next set of goals. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah. All right. Global outcomes, implementation updates, uh, follow up by communication to wider community in October. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. Presentation, I'm sure, unless the presentation was in Zoom. I don't know. I don't think we did the, we were going to write up an article. I don't think we did. So I don't think we, I don't think we could do that. I don't know. That's okay. It was October. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Um, let's uh, let's mark that as like outstanding. So let, let's look at this as a group, and then schedule presentation of the year, showing as a unit you know, project. So we and student spotlight on success. We've been doing that. An update on our geos, and I think we're going to do the update on the geos today on this agenda. Student presentations. We have been doing that on. We did in January the art show with Misty Tharp. I have that outlined. Um, in February, we did the sports medicine simulation with Pam Fry's group. And then 321, the engineering brightness project with the elementary school. So I think we should add that those are tasks that yeah. we completed in here. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, we'll get the global outcome update today from Ruby. That's later on our agenda. Um, and then the thing I can't speak to is the October update. So, yeah, the board member had a better memory than me. And that, so you're talking the one that says presentation and follow up communication to the wider community. Yeah. That would have been where one of the board members writes up everything that they've seen and communicates it to the community. So that's why I think it's. Orange that did not get done. So we can mark that. I mean, it sounds like we're not for certain if that was done or not. For now, we can mark that unknown. And then if we find we we can change that if we can find that communication. Yeah. 
Um, well, I can tell it, it wasn't done because I oh, was okay. the one to proof it and then send it out for them. So, okay, so we can mark that as not done. Not and done. <laughs> yep, on the flip side, we can include what we added um, or the student presentations. Yeah, and then we can add the geo update. Does that sound fair? Yeah. All right. Um, continue to monitor the pandemic. Um, that we had the February 9th meeting where uh, Tom Gonzalez. Tom Gonzalez, thank you. Boy, that name yes. escaped me. <laughs> came and provided an update. So I think we can mark that as accomplished. And then we aligned with uh, Loma County Health Guidelines for going mask optional. And that was the February 9th meeting. Safety report that was already done. And that actually brings us to the end of our goals. Ooh, thank you. Right? <laughs> John, do you have anything to add to number four? Nope, that's pretty complete. Um, is nope, student services isn't okay. Just double checking something. All right. Does anybody want a break before we move on to? The next side of which is Global Outcomes Update by Ruby Bodie. I could use a bathroom break. Uh -huh. That's why I was wondering. Let's take about a five minute break. John, we're going to take about a five minute break and stretch and use a bathroom break. I'll do the same. <laughs> <laughs> John back on. I'm here. All right, it's 1041, we're back in session. Um, we're gonna continue, actually the global health check, Ruby is gonna cover the superintendent 2021-22 goals. And a part of that will also be 3B global outcomes update. So she'll cover an update on the superintendent goals and include in that 3B global outcomes update. Ruby, you have the floor. Yep. The second goal is all about global outcomes. So. I shared a document with all of you, and it's just a report I wrote that you can have that I think I'm going to cover today under each of those bullet points. So there were four board goals. Uh, Laszlo actually covered the gifted divergent one in his presentation. So I'm going to go for the other three. And under each of those, there were three or four bullet points. So I'll just kind of do a summary of each bullet point. So the first of the goals is the achievement and growth gap. So it was cultural and linguistically diverse learners and what our strategies were there. There were four bullet points under this goal. So the first one was to evaluate the current state of our district using the ELD rubric from CDE and develop an action plan. So it, it's this rubric that really helped us evaluate our ELD program and develop our K-12 plan, which we wrote for the first time last year in partnership with CDE and then the whole ELD team and the instructional coaches and principals. And so we use, we've been using this rubric to evaluate, to do a self-evaluation of our programming for the last, since 2018. Um, the rubric looks like this. There's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different categories, and they each go into really big specifics. So what we do, and I'm actually doing this on Thursday, um, no, it's the 13th, that's Friday. On Friday, in our meeting with all of our, EL, our English language development team, we're going to be doing this again for our end of the year evaluation. And so we go through these rubrics and everybody individually marks where they are. And then we open it up for discussion to commonly agree and jointly agree on where we think we fall. This is our spring of last year's rubric. So you can see we're not in the final column of optimizing in any of our areas. Um, we're gonna be reflecting on this Friday and we are in developing or operationalizing in most of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we felt we were in the spring last year when we developed our plan. Since then, in that plan, we've doubled our ELD staff. We brought on our bilingual liaisons in our buildings to increase the support we have for our Spanish speaking families. And so we'll see where we are now and then we'll continue to plan for next year and how we wanna improve our programming. So that's planned for, um, for Thursday, for, for Friday. Identify and implement activities that will engage underrepresented populations is the second bullet point there. So as you know, we've continued the cultural and linguistically diverse populations focus group. We've only met five times this year. Um, actually, we met six times this year if you count the August meeting. We 
kind of pause on this semester when I went part-time because I lead that group and I wasn't available and we had some conflicting scheduling because I have evening classes till eight every <laughs> all the time. Um, so we're planning to, to pick that back up when we start again in the fall. Um, that group meets monthly and they share celebrations in each building that are happening toward our population of cultural and linguistically diverse students and their families. So that's always how we start the meetings. We share what's going on in the buildings and the improvements we're making. The main goal, and th then we have community members that come. So they share what's going on in the community. So we hear what's going on with the town and the efforts the town's making and the rec center and all, all of our um, community members will share what they see happening in the town. The main goal of the focus group is to support family and community partnering within the classroom, school, and district for emerging bilingual students and their families. And that's where we started this work. That was our main goal. Throughout this year, we've also discussed ways to increase and amplify student voice um, in regards to equity and inclusion. Sony Greedway is leading a little task force on that specific discussion. And then we've also discussed um, the teachers have also discussed looking deeper into their curriculum for cultural relevance and responsiveness. So that's another thing that we've been discussing. Not a whole lot of action on that discussion because that was in our last meeting and we, um, we haven't had a meeting since February. Uh, the group has gathered to, oh, I already said that, we wanna regain momentum. We've kind of put it on pause this semester. We've hosted this year, one of the things we added, as you know, this is the group that's responsible for the Dia de los, de los Muertos planning and committee. And I serve on that planning committee along with Jose, our, one of our liaisons. Um, we also hosted our very first Hispanic Heritage Day. We didn't get to have anything, an event in person. We did a parade mm -hmm. drive through. Some of you yeah. were there and drove through, it was great. Um, handed out a lot of goodies. So that was our first one. And we want to do that every year. Um, and then we're looking forward to continuing to plan Dia de los Muertos and then being involved in Cinco de Mayo. So this group sponsors, we do fundraising and we sponsor both of those events. We sponsored the face painting at Cinco de, Cinco de Mayo last, um, just on Friday. And um, thanks to Heather who represented our district because I couldn't be there. I was at a different fundraising event for a different nonprofit that I'm a part of. Bummer that they were on the same day. Um, so yeah, we'll continue that work. We also, um, we hosted, so we've been inviting, we have families, we have parents that serve on this committee, but one of the things that continued to come up was could we have a conversation that's just all in Spanish because a lot of things are lost when you're translating for everybody between English and Spanish. So it was an evening conversation in, in Espanol with the assistant superintendent. And so I just sat and I spoke with families in Spanish. And so that's the only language we used. It was really great. It was very that's comfortable awesome. and everybody was able to just share their thoughts in their first language. I have minimal English and I would classify myself as beginning and immediate level. <laughs> Yo practico espanol cada día, pero no fluente. Um, so we, Patricia did a lot of translating and I also used a, a translator device in my ear so that it translates, I could pick up what I wasn't getting um, from my limited vocabulary. So that was a really great thing. And I'd like to continue that maybe twice a year. We did that once in the, this winter and I'd love to invite you guys too. And we could have you use the translators and uh, I would like to do that twice next year, great. once in the fall and then in the spring. We, so adopt a curriculum for EL acquisition and align the standards for students at each grade level was another bullet point. So the curriculum that we adopted and we actually have this curriculum through 2004 or 2024, sorry, school year. And it's National Geographic curriculum. And it, it's really a curriculum that's more than we need. And the reason is because it's a comprehensive common core English language arts curriculum. And it's developed to be a pull out class for bilingual for emerging bilinguals in itself, but in our programming that we have developed, our bilingual students are in the general education English classroom. So it's more than we need because they're enrolled in a common core English class and, con and consecutively enrolled in a language acquisition class. So we are looking at exploring some new curriculum. We piloted an HMH 3D English curriculum this year in the high school for one class that has really good feedback from the teacher and the students. 
We also, when we adopted this curriculum back in 2018, we adopted it for a long time, six years when we adopted it. When we adopted it, we didn't adopt anything for the elementary at that time. And the reason we didn't is because they were in, they were adopting collaborative classroom and doing all the professional development in collaborative classroom. In. And collaborative classroom had an ELD component, English language development component. And at that time, teachers thought that would be enough. What we're learning now is it's not for our non-English proficient and our limited English proficient, our NEP and LEP students. So we still have that pull out language acquisition class for those students. And so we brought in piloting the EL Achieve curriculum this year. And that's a curriculum that we have gone down and we've watched it in action in Poudre several years ago. Poudre School District uses this curriculum. They've received a lot of awards, as you know, for their growth and their English language learners over the years. And so we have piloted that with our ELD teachers this year and they like it. Um, so we may look at adopting that at the elementary level. The two curriculums we're looking at, HMH, is only grades four through 12, while EL Achieve is only grades K through eight. So they don't cover, we don't, and if, if you've explored English language development curriculum, it's limited what's out there. It's not like 21 we looked at for science. We have very few to look at. So 3D English is a brand new from HMH. It's a brand new curriculum. That's why we wanted to take a look at it. And so just so you know, that's where we're at with that. Both of these are at much lower cost than our current National Geographic curriculum. So Ruby, on that, would you see, foresee dropping the National Geographic and then bringing one of the EL, newer EL to the board for, like, yes. we'll need to once review that? Yep. Yeah, once the contract is up. And then how does that, that, if collaborative classroom is, is that element of missing component, how are our teachers incorporating that? Is that being pushed into our classrooms yeah. with teacher, uh -huh. our teachers are being trained as yeah. well as, okay, yeah. as, just, as in addition to our EL teachers. That's a great question. Our classroom So they teachers. have that ELD component right. in the curriculum, but it's really geared toward our, what are, are labeled FEP, which is Fluent English Proficient Students. And fluent, not academic language fluent, but they're fluent to the point where they have um, tested high enough on the read access scores in their conversational English that they are now um, not considered limited English anymore, but still need supports in the classroom, still need a lot of ELD support in the classroom. So that those, uh, it's sufficient we're hearing for those students that are still emerging bilinguals, but are non-English and limited English proficient students are the ones that need that added support to build academic vocabulary which is where ELG comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the creating individual plans for EL learners um, shared by all teachers. So this is a big step we've transitioned over the last three years. It became evident through this process of the rubric that we used to identify where we're at. Um, we identified that that shared ownership of English language development plans is lacking. And a lot of it was a lot of the, the diagnosis of the problem was because we have English language development case managers that were writing these plans with families and with students and then um, getting feedback from the teacher, but it wasn't a plan that was owned by the teacher and the teacher wasn't tracking the progress and the improvements and the goals. So now we've transitioned over the years to having teach the classroom teachers write those ELD plans in conjunction with the case manager and the family so that the teachers are very involved in setting the goals and tracking the goals in the classroom and much more involved. And the goal here is that we are changing our philosophy to we are all English language development teachers. We have a large portion of our students that are emerging bilingual. All of us are English language development teachers and we'll own that and know what those goals are and, and be involved in that. So that's a big transition we've made at the elementary school level. At the high school level and the middle school level, not huge changes there. We have the case managers. Now those students travel to eight different classes with eight different teachers. So we use that structured PLC time for the case managers to meet with teachers, answer questions about the goals, um, and ELD teachers supporting those teachers with, with supporting the student goals in there that are in the development plan. So that is what how, how it looks at the secondary level. And then I just wanted to add about professional development for teachers under this bullet point because it's really important that we continue to improve our own professional learning surrounding ELD practices. So 
We have always over the summer offered 50, it's part of our CLDE approved state approved curriculum. We've offered 50 strategies for English language learners is the name of it because we use as an anchor test that book, 50 strategies for EL learners. And so that's one class course we offer really geared specifically at how you support non-English proficient and limited English proficient students in the classroom. Another one we've offered is culturally responsive teaching in the brain, which is based in neurology and how the brain learns. And so we've offered both of those, but it's always mandatory. Even though we actually have a really high percentage of teachers that have taken those over the last four years, what we'd like to add for the upcoming school year with the additional professional development days expanding at the beginning of the year is a mandatory refresher. So as new teachers take these classes, what happens to the practices? Are we continuing and are we refreshing those promising practices? So we want to do a mandatory refresher this upcoming August for everybody. Um, and of course, continue. we're going to continue to offer those optional classes too. So that is, I guess there was, yeah. Only you know, there were four more points under that one. Can I ask another Any question on the transition of the planes to the, te the classroom teachers? Uh -huh. Like, I totally understand that theory because it does make them evolve. How do they feel, though, about the workload? Because that, do they feel like that's a big increase on their workload? Or, and then how do you support huge. that, right? Because that's a new role for them, if you will. Sure. Yeah. They, do, they need continued support in that. And well, what I can tell you is they get continued support because we have two ELD teachers at that school now. We typically have about 90 students on ELD plans, either non-English proficient limited or fluent that still need to be supported. And we had one case manager. So that would be one person writing 90 plans. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And then having to communicate those plans while still providing a pull-out language acquisition class and pushing into classrooms. So you can imagine where ELD plans got lost in the mix. So I think, yes, it is an added workload to teachers. I think I don't have a good sense on how teachers feel about it, but I do have a good sense of how ELD teachers feel about it, which is that it is much more realistic and the, students, the teachers are much more involved in the plans. Um, and what I hear from principals about it, which is this is the best thing that we could have done because now we are feel like everyone's involved in supporting our ELD students. But it's a change and it's a practice that we, that needs to become a habit and it's newer for us. Um, and keeping in mind that we have you know, very, we're lucky and fortunate in our district to have small class sizes in our elementary school. So we have our, our technical student to teacher ratio in the elementary is one teacher to 11 students, but that includes all of our support staff. So that includes our special education teachers, our counselor and our coach and our ELD staff. Um, so typically, in the younger grade levels, we really try to keep that ratio at 1 to 15, which is the recommendation for early primary elementary, and 1 to 20 for grades 4 and 5. So upper elementary, 1 to 20, we try to keep it at that ratio. So when you think about that, um, spreading those 90 plans right. into a few in each classroom distributes the ownership. And if the teacher owns that, then they're more involved and engaged with what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad that you added the professional development training because I was wondering about that. And that's so important. So I love yeah. that that's added to this. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, we are always learning so much every day about how to, how to teach. And we're dividing the students and and I think um, that continued training and we really try to um, focus on asset based training so we're not seeing language development as a, a disability or a barrier but as a, an asset for students who are bilingual have incredible cognitive ability and it's really um, it's really an asset that those students have and so seeing it as that. The second one's global outcomes and performance assessments. Uh, that one has three bullets, I think. The first is to develop and implement professional learning and coaching strategies to increase collaborative problem-based opportunities. So you'll see, I, I wrote a lot under this one because it's an area that we've really focused hard on this year. So we, we developed last year, three-year plan to increase teacher talent and expand project-based learning opportunities for students through, throughout the district. We chose gold standard PBL as our model. 
we chose that model because it embeds global outcomes to a really high level in that model and that it has a large component of assessing creativity, collaboration, communication, and um, critical thinking in the classroom and comes with tons of resources to do that. So gold standard PBL is, is the most researched based project-based learning that is out there. It was formerly the Buck Institute, but now it's called PBL Works. They offer a lot of project-based learning and they also for the first year ever, they are partnering with the college board in AP to offer courses in project-based learning for AP courses because they want to improve the relevancy of AP courses. And we have teacher, two teachers that are gonna be taking the US government AP PBL course this summer. And cool. they're going to be co-teaching that class. So it's part of, of this plan. I'll talk more about it. Uh, so mm -hmm. we really focus. Oh, sorry, I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. You can ask questions. Will we be able to offer that class next year then? Yeah. Yes. Yep. We're offering that class at the high school next year. Um, and then they also are offering it for a few more classes, like environmental science has. Uh, there's like there's six AP classes yeah. that are partnering with PBL Works. Um, we just need to, our teachers, it's, it's kind of based on if our teachers have the time to take the training. So if not this year, next year they will. But um, yeah, so we, we, um, we're really excited about that. We're excited about it, uh, about a lot of things, but we really focus hard on this at the high school this year. And I bring project-based learning into this goal because that's the rationale and the reason of why we brought project-based learning, design and development and planning into our action plan is because it's a great model for teaching global outcomes and assessing global outcomes in the classroom and making learning relevant and realistic for kids mm -hmm. and applicable. Um, so we piloted the summer program, it was 20 days and it was piloted as a credit recovery. Remember we're using ESSER funds for this. So we need to be responding to student learning. And part of what we found out when we surveyed students is that was, they're losing engagement in school during the pandemic. And so it's to recharge and re-engage them in their learning. They were able to recover credit in math, English, language arts and science this summer. And then while that was happening, we hosted a two day workshop. We had six teachers come in that wanted to dig into PBL this year. And they went and did instructional rounds observing the students and the teachers in the PBL classroom. And then they got to design their own PBL lessons. And so those teachers continued that work in their buildings this year. Um, and then we also just a little bit more surrounding the increasing professional learning. We have four teachers at the elementary that have continued to co-design project-based learning um, together and co-deliver it together. So that has been really neat. They're working with their instructional coach. In addition, at the elementary school, we have, we're sending one of the principals, Aaron, and six teachers, not sending. They have been taking a three-month course in the Teton Mountain School, offers a place-based mm -hmm. learning. You'll often hear place-based, project-based, problem-based. They all have a little bit of a different tweak, but they're all very similar. And so they are taking that intensive course in place-based learning. And then those teachers will be leaders in their PLCs for incorporating more project-based learning into their grade level teams at the elementary school level. So that is happening. Actually, they're just, they I think they finished up the course just a few weeks ago. At the middle school level, we have two teachers continuing to pilot PBL in their classroom, working with their coaches. And then at the high school, we have four teachers working with Mark and Shana, our PBL teachers to um, do some co-teaching, to co-lesson plan design in their classrooms too. And so they're just dipping their toes in it, trying to, they're piloting some things and getting some feedback and doing some coaching together on that. So we'll continue all of that for next year and the, the years to come. We did collect some feedback. I included it in here. We sent a survey out to our PBL classes for students to take a survey. About half of them did. Um, well, not even a third of them did. And then the three teachers involved did um, give us some feedback as well. And so those are just some comments that they had to say about the PBL class that I included in there for you. Um, and then, so next year, our next move surrounding this in our plan is we are going to be continuing that PBL pilot that the teachers are co-teaching, which is a double block for students. 
Um, and a big part of that is refining it. They're feeling really good about it. They're feeling really good about the capstone involved in that. And so it's a course that especially seniors who wanna do a capstone for the graduation requirement will sign up for that class because the capstone's embedded in that class. And so we're gonna have them continue to refine that one while they each are co-teaching another upper level class. AP is one of them. Another one is gonna be a class called GOMO. It stands for Geography, Oceanography, Meteorology and Astronomy. And it also incorporates physics, but it counts for freshmen if they take it as their earth science credit and, and a science elective. And it's a more advanced class. So they're gonna be co-teaching together, co-teaching with another teacher to really develop their capacity and then they're going to spend their other day when they're not teaching, coaching throughout the other buildings. So we, these PBL teachers will now become added coaching support specific to PBL lesson plan and design and delivery in the other buildings, if that makes sense. And then we'll expand another year out the next year. So our idea here is to start small and refine those practices and get professional learning and then start to add on teachers that are ready and eager, and then also continue professional development for our coaches. So while Mark and Shana have attended the PBL Works training and, and all of that, and Shana will be doing the AP training this summer, um, our other instructional coaches haven't. So we're gonna be continuing to get them into PBL 101 courses and get them more so that all of our instructional coaching team is really well-trained and gold standard PBL. So that is where we're at with the professional learning. How, how receptive do you feel like the general teaching population is to the coaching? Of PBL or just in general instructional coaching? PBL. Well, it's such a small population of teachers right now. It's just four teachers working with right. Mark and Shana. I think, I think, oh, I, and I forgot to add that. I think the reception from those four who are working is really great. Uh -huh. They also have, we've done some, another thing we've done, I have it in here, I just skipped it. We have done some visits outside of our district to other PBL schools and those staff members came. So they got to see what other schools are doing, how they're implementing it, which is really great. But then they got to come back and, and talk about it. I think that there is a gap. And I think that gap is that there's other teachers in the building that don't, haven't been in the PBL classroom and they don't see what's going on and they don't understand what it is yet. And they haven't had the knowledge and training. So I think Another thing we want to do next year in all buildings, so this isn't necessarily specific to BBL, but it's right. in all buildings. Our instructional coaching team is really working hard on getting tight on a model for instructional rounds in the building. So teachers being able to visit each other's classrooms mm -hmm. and reflect on their That's own great. practice. The purpose is to see one of the great things I feel fortunate about being an administrator is I have been in hundreds and hundreds of classrooms. I have seen such a variety of instruction and it has made me such a better teacher, even though I'm not teaching kids, I am teaching adults, huh. but like, I just wish every teacher got that opportunity and we're gonna make that happen. I mean, our instructional coaches get to watch great instruction all the time, but other teachers don't. So it's really important we get into each other's classrooms and then apply what we're learning to our own reflection and our own growth and development. We made a model for that and we had begun incorporating that and COVID hit and we haven't been in each other's classrooms since. So we really want to bring that back and do those instructional rounds together. And I think Jason, in answer to that question, we will be getting more teachers into that project-based mm -hmm. classroom to see what's happening and how the students are engaging and the high level of rigor that students are asked to perform that in those classrooms. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but the teachers involved, I think, are yeah. seeing that because they're, you know, they're involved. Um, I guess that was in, what did I miss? Oh, we've curated a bank of resources and I was just gonna pull this up to show you guys what we've done here. So we have a bank of resources, but it hasn't been shared staff-wide because we, the training's not there. And if they get these resources, they won't, we'll be like, how do I how do I use and apply this in the classroom? Um, so one of the things I'll show you is these are this is a lot of the resources we got by participating and paying for the PBL 101 training. And this is what I talked a little bit about why we chose gold standard design. And it's because it implements global outcomes to such a high level. These are all resources surrounding 
specifically to the global outcomes. Like if you dig into this critical thinking one, it has rubrics aligned to the, to the common core, critical thinking for assessing. And it starts here with something that looks like this, which would be for your kindergartners on your early elementary and works up to, where's the high school one? 612 um, rubric and design. So we've talked a lot about assessing and giving feedback to students on global outcomes. And we've built the global outcome continuum continuum so we've shared those with you in the past but this allows us to really get tight on feedback and um, what excellence looks like how excellence is demonstrated and reflect on on our skills there so I I think that's just the rubrics one but there's just a lot of great resources there's a we've curated a bunch of teacher resources for developing and implementing things. We've, de we've curated some um, student resources for preparing for your presentation and community member feedback when you have community members come in and listen to your student, um, student led performance based assessments and lots of good stuff there, how to make a podcast. So that's another thing we have done surrounding this goal. Once we get more teacher training, we'll be sharing that out. And our goal is to eventually get this to all teachers so that they see um, what project-based learning is about and how it's implemented with fidelity and how it can be effective. It's very difficult to do. That's what I'll speak to about project-based learning. It, it is very, it is very time consuming up front with your planning and development. And but once once you are having some success with it, the benefits of learning are just astounding. Like the relevancy to student learning, how engaged they are. You know, I can share a story of a conversation I had with one of our PLD, PBL teachers of, you know, they had have a student who, who um, has put hours and hours and hours into a project that he's working on outside of the classroom. Teacher didn't ask them to do this, didn't assign any homework. The student has done hours of homework on their own because they're passionate about what they're doing and they care about it. And they've just spent hours researching and meeting with the local newspaper and the rec center director and all of these things to build the, the project title they're working on is, is change the world, make the world a better place. And it's just the, how often do we fight with students about doing homework and the student is just creating his own homework for himself and that's just one student story but they're seeing that throughout in the, in the classes once they once it's done well i just wanted to share some of the because part of what they've developed here is experiential learning as well and they have we've made some tight partnerships with the rangers in the parks they've been in the parks probably six times this year or the parks been in here in the classrooms and we were you know, I'm excited to say, because it's in our backyard, you know, we have an advantage, but we were the first student group to come back into the park after COVID. We were the first student group to do their winter um, science field trip with them, um, which was very fun. I like to go on the field trips when I can, and I also like to take pictures when I can. So this is the summer program. That's, that's our TBL teachers. This is Mark and Shana. Um, they, we did a, as part of the fire, the wildland fire project we we went out and we did some restoration in the park in some of the burn areas with the kids and so we got to learn all about the history of the park and um, they learned how to read maps that was a great skill mm -hmm. orienteering which we realized our students needed and so that's at this one was at devil's backbone um, so they've been getting out. That was in the burn area in the park. We were the first group to go in the burn area, which is super exciting. This is at Bear Lake. This was our winter science expedition. We've dug some snow caves and did some uh, snow science on that day. We also had our first experience snowshoeing for a lot of our kids. So there was a little bit of falling down happening. Um, it, was, it was a really good time. And so we really appreciate the Rangers. I'll let you see a little video. We really appreciate the Rangers letting us come in so often. Oh, maybe not. It won't play. Um, so that is on our snow. That's a, one of the stations, the one by Bear Lake, if you've been there, that collects snow data. So we, what we did is they have 
satellites and lots of great technology that take all the data, but then the students had to do it by hand. So we dug our snow caves, we by hand took all the data, did all the math calculations, and then compared it to the data they were getting with their technology was the point of that trip. So lots of fun. So I wanted to share that with you so you can see a little bit about what PBL is about. And under global outcomes. Um, so we have, I, I shared with the, the teachers, we, we've also purchased PBL toolkit, which is like a starter book for some teachers. So those teachers I mentioned, the four at the high school, the fourth elementary, the two at the middle school, we purchased that for them and they, they can dig into that toolkit. It's what we use for our two day workshop this summer in our summer PD. And so it's the gold standard design PBL toolkit. And so I was a little repetitive there. And then as far as staff continuing to integrate global outcomes into their classrooms, we have the gl common global outcome continuums at the middle and high school that teachers can use with students to reflect on their global outcomes. And I believe you've seen those, so I didn't pull them up for this presentation. This year, grades three through eight conducted student-led conferences that place students as the leaders of their learning, reflecting on their global outcome competencies, their strengths and their areas for growth. The middle school actually started that the previous year. They piloted it for us. We've expanded now to third, down to third grade and we hope to expand up to high school and down even to the earlier elementaries. Um, and then the middle school has embedded daily GOs in their learning targets. If you go into the middle school classrooms, you will see the GOs in their learning targets. They worked hard on that. And then the instructional coach, Sonia and Janet, they have created a global outcome feedback template for when they walk through a classroom to give um, some feedback on the global outcomes that they're seeing in the classroom. So, and, and then at the high school, the instructional coach continues to focus on coaching teachers with performance-based assessments. We began that last year at the high school and every teacher committed to give it a go for at least one of their end of year assessments. And so John continues to support teachers there. So that is the global outcome goal. Ruby, any questions about that one? My heart is about to jump out of my chest. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I participated in project-based learning as a teacher. And it was, I heard about it. It was not everyone was on board. I tried to launch into it myself and did some of the project based learning activities with my classroom. And it is hard. Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand is integration of curriculum. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at those goals and standards, but making it, making it more engaging mm -hmm. in the real world. Yeah. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, so, that's, that's key, so engaging the whole So it's mm -hmm. exciting. And my grandchildren go to a project-based learning school in Castle Rock. Oh, cool. So it's cool to have them there, observe, help the teachers participate in their classrooms and seeing what they're doing. And it's not just that that is the focus of everything, because they still teach reading and writing and math. But, you know, being able to integrate that into project-based learning at the school is really cool. So it's exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, we'd, we'd like to do some of the school doing. visits again next week, too. We, yes. we took a group of, of high school teachers, the ones that are partnering with Mark and Shana. We took a group of high school teachers to a Denver project-based learning school. And then we took a middle and elementary and a high school and an instructional coach teacher, Sonia, took... Um, that group down to a K-8 PBL school in Cooter School District. Because they give us talk for teachers. That's exciting. Yeah. Got me home. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you're excited about it. It is hard to do, Ava, and like you said, it's very different from what I think a lot of people who haven't dug into the research behind project-based mm -hmm. learning see it as like, oh, it's when a teacher does a project. Like, oh, it's when you have a make a, a replica of okay. Machu Picchu and then yes. explain it. But that's, it's so much more than it that. It's, it's a theme that drives all the learning they do in that unit with that driving question that's relevant to their lives and relevant to the world they live in, that they work toward. And, and it's so um, engaging. They yeah. don't realize that they're learning all that they're learning, but doing all the things they're doing within that project. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when learning's fun, 
We don't see it as learning. Yes. <laughs> Which is how we're it should not be. learning if it's fun. Should feel like right? learning. Yes. Good morning it's fun. should be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. The more you talk to us, I think our parents are I there. love sharing about <laughs> what's happening in that classroom. And you'll see John Anderson's in there too. He's the instructional coach. He's been well. Um, he's been learning a ton right alongside Mark and Shana because he's involved in all the field trips and all that they're doing in the classroom too. So really developing his capacity there too to support other teachers in the high school. Yeah, just really great. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. And then goal three. So students' perceptions and social emotional wellness. I kind of talked a little bit about a few things in here because you had asked me a question about restorative practices earlier. Um, three bullet points into this one. So one was reviewing, review sources of data and refine data usage and get use data from student feedback to inform decisions. So one of the things that we realized in working with the counselors this year is we don't really compile and collect the counseling data and we did this and maybe it's been shared with you um we i i just kind of challenged challenged the counseling team to start collecting data and find how you fi find a way to collect the data where it makes sense to you in your practice and will inform us and help us make decisions for our schools and so they they did and they're still collecting data all the way till the end of the year but this is an example of one of the school's data um, and then they they discuss like how do they want to keep collecting this and what should the categories be and this particular school had a lot of categories and so what they did is they just started collecting visits you can see this counselor had 220 222 visits from the beginning of the year to mid-year we did this in January we reflected and this is the categories they collected so every time they had a visit a student came to visit them they would mark a category that it would fall into. I think the overall conversation is let's see if we can get more like what does the check-in mean? Could that category go away and could it fit in one of those other areas and we'd kind of like to to condense. But what it does for us is it really is a powerful tool for us to see where are the social and emotional needs of our students and it's really good then the counselors took this to their staff at a staff meeting and said here's where we're at. As a staff, it's important to be informed about that because these are the students in your classroom and it's important for you to be knowledgeable as a whole what our students are struggling with out there and um, so that we can think about our daily practice and how we can improve some of these areas. So that is something we began doing. We'd like to continue to refine the way that we collect data and use it to improve our practices in the future. It's an area where we have just started and now we wanna keep going and we wanna do more reflection there. Um, and then also we collect data through our panorama survey. And I'm not sure how much this has been shared with you all. Um, so we, we give a social emotional learning survey. We did in 2021 and I think we will again in 2023 spring um, in order to not have survey fatigue. We give a panorama yeah. survey every year for our culture. So we do our culture survey every year and that's this one. It's the, um, these are the areas, cl classroom community, classroom management, student learning, student centered environment. And so we give this one every year. But this one we added on, we actually just piloted it first. Really, year. I don't think we've seen this. Okay. Um, this is our SEL from spring of 2021. And I, I didn't know if this was shared with you or not. This is three categories. So classroom, effort, emotional regulation, and supportive relationships. And we have a we can pick and choose. We can make this a super long survey, or we can hone in and focus on like areas we're interested in. And so what you'll see there in the green dot is the percentile we are with others three through five that take this nas nationally. So the, com the company that publishes it is Panorama, it's a nationwide survey. And so where our students are is 75% in classroom effort gave favorable results and where we fall nationally is between the 40th and 59th percentile. It's good to see where we really wanna see our scores is above the 50th percentile. That's where we wanna see our scores. 
And you'll see emotional regulation is 50% favorable results, but which seems very, very low. But when you're compared nationally, we're actually falling in the 60 to 79th percentile compared to students in grades three through five nationally. Um, so students are saying this about this themselves? Point. Yes, okay. students yeah. take this about themselves. Um, and then supportive relationships. That's great. Yeah. 90% favorable results in the 80th to 99th percentile compared to others nationally. Granted, this was during the pandemic um, mm -hmm. in 2021. We had just returned back to in-person learning when students took this survey. It breaks down here. Um, you can actually see the questions. These are some of the questions asked. And we can make this as long or as like some of these surveys, like we have a lot of choices here. We can have students take it for an hour if we want to keep adding questions. Uh, how much effort do you put into your homework? Overall, how hard do you try in class? How much effort do you put into learning all of the material for your class? Emotional regulation, here's some of the questions. How do, how do you pull yourself out of a bad mood? When everyone around you gets angry, how relaxed can you stay? Once you get upset, how often can you get yourself to relax? Can you control your emotions when you need to? How calm are you able to stay? And then supportive relationships. Do you have a teacher or other adults in the school that you can count on? That's really important to us. We, we another thing our counselors do is they make sure they, they have every student identify a, one a trusted adult in the building to make sure that all of our students have a trusted adult in the, build, in so the building. So you select the questions within the national survey that you choose for- What we did is we artists. selected the categories. Categories, okay. And then the questions there's, come with the categories. There's a lot more categories to this. You can, what yeah, I, from what I understood, and I'll have to check back with Debbie, you can, it can be a lot of categories. Yes. We, we try to, you know, and then you have to decide what you're gonna focus. So these are the three that we're focusing on right now. We can always expand later or, or change things later. Do you have a family member outside of school? That's really important to us as well. And do you have a friend in school? And we were really thrilled to see these results for our three through five students. Yeah, and do you say we follow, you, we follow up to make sure like every student has a trusted Yeah. Adult? So they do we know like activity. those 10? Like do yes. you know the 10 and you can check them? Yes, okay. we, we do. So our, our counselors do, they call it a red dot activity where they, um, they identify, I can't remember exactly how they do it, but for all of the students who aren't able to identify a trusted adult at school, the counselor will have a one-on-one -on -one with them mm, and great. make sure they're checking great. with them and make sure they build a relationship. Yeah, so that's a good practice. And then these are our six through 12 results. So classroom effort, we're at 71%. Same, same actually as the elementary, that's interesting. Emotional regulation, 55, similar yeah. to elementary, but also in the 80 to 99th percentile nationally. Supportive relationships, 82% positive, 60 to 79th percentile. So we're happy to see those numbers and the questions are, uh, yeah, they're the same, basically. A few, more, a few different ones, but you get the idea of the categories. And I can always send these to you if you wanna see our results until you have them, if you'd like. I can put them videos. out in our board packets would be helpful. Ruby. Okay. Just if you bet. we could put them out there because then we can keep referring to them. Yeah, you bet. And the, this one, I don't know that it falls under these goals for social emotional support, but this, if, if you hadn't seen it yet, I will add it to the board packet. This is the one we give every spring. We have for many years. We have, I think, I'll ask Debbie. I think it's been nine, maybe eight or nine years. We've given it every spring. They presented on this at MSAC, and she said, Janice, they've been doing it a while. It's been a wanted. long, yeah, it's been a long time. Um, one thing to note here this is a culture survey, is what it is. It's a school culture survey. Um, and what you For see what here grades, uh, Ruby? three through 12 again. Three, 12, yeah, okay. we don't give it to the primary students. So You'll see here this number underneath shows where we are since the last survey. And I'm pleased with our results. You'll see here, what grades are we in? Are we in three through five? In three through five, no change here. A zero means no change. That's the exact percent of favorable responses we got. And then over here again, you see where we are nationally. Classroom management, we went up four points, four percentage points. Um, student learning up three. Student-centered environment, we stayed the same. And then you can look through the questions if you want here. 
And then over here on the six through 12, we have a 2% percentage point gain in classroom community, 3% uh, in classroom management, 5% in student learning, and student-centered environment went up one. So up in every area, six through 12. And the reason I guess I, I would include this in your packet with this goal is that the school culture largely reflects social emotional wellness and belonging. And so it falls into this goal. And it's something we, we are focusing hard on. I mean, we're, and our funding matches our focus there by adding a new, an additional, so that we have two social worker mental health clinicians in our district, we really want to keep improving our school culture and expanding in this area. So it's an area of focus for, her, for us for sure, as far as data collection to inform our decisions. So that is that. And then identify and provide a range of resources, internal and external for students. I guess I segued into this by saying we are adding an additional social emotional uh, social worker and mental health clinician because we are moving Sam Lara into that position and then we have right now we have a counseling position open at the the high school and so we're adding two and Courtney who's our current social worker has just really closed a gap for us as far as community outreach and external support she's working very hard to work within the county and within the town to identify the needed supports for our students. One of the areas we really struggle is finding Spanish speaking mental health counselors. It's, it's not an SS Park problem, it's an all of Colorado problem, but we're really um, finding a lot of creative ideas with some other nonprofits for making those things happen. And it's just really, it's so nice now to be in conversations with principals and counselors and families and being able to turn to the family and say, we can help get that resource for you. We can help connect you. We can help provide you with this. And so that's been really powerful in the meetings that I have set in with families. And then provide professional learning surrounding SEL for key staff members. So as far as professional learning here goes, I'm happy to say we're retaining all of our counselors for the first year in a long time. It's really important to us because counselor mm -hmm. turnover doesn't allow you to do any professional learning and professional development. So we're sending our whole counseling team to Texas in July. Um, they're going to be attending the National Counseling Conference. And so it's a whole week long of workshops and sessions and, and uh, speakers. And while they're there, they're going to be de developing our K-12 plan for career and college counseling and for social and emotional wellness all the way K through 12. So that's a huge step in our professional development. So we're investing so we're a lot in that. For the new high school, incoming new high school counselor, because we're getting one to yeah. one. We'll, if we onboard them, will they have that opportunity? Yeah, we'll get okay. registered. You can register all the way up until mid-June. So, okay. so we'll, I already got the hotel and we just need to register the person. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, Oh, so you guys know, because it came up in another work session that we provided QPR training for all of our teachers, 100% of our staff. That's a suicide prevention training for staff yeah. members. And then for next year, so I talked a little bit about this. I told you we want to add restorative, or I, I told you we want to add EL, English language development refresher into our mandatory training. And you guys know we have added PD days, district PD days at the beginning of the year. Teachers are here for a whole week now rather than just three days. So we have more time to train district staff and do professional learning. So the SEL team has been working on a plan to deliver mandatory PD for all the staff when they return to school and some other areas. Every year we always, because we're required to, <laughs> um, either federal or state requirements, we already provide mandatory training for discrimination and harassment, Title IX, bloodborne pathogens, and um, mandatory reporting. So those are already mandatory, but we'd like to add to that is, a, is QPR training, so suicide prevention training. Um, and then we also wanna add restorative practices refresher, de-escalation behavior training, and trauma-informed response training to all of our staff. So um, it'll look like, well, I'm not sure what it'll look like. We haven't totally designed it yet, but it'll, it'll look like some of them we have done online in the past, but we're rethinking that now that we can be in person. So, 
yeah, we're adding that as a refresher. And I talked a lot, but hopefully it gave you a good idea of the superintendent goals, where we are as a district, and I'll follow up by getting these things to Heather. Great, thanks a lot. <laughs> Probably good work going on. I feel good about it. Yeah. We we continue to work hard. <laughs> we continue <laughs> yes, to work really do. hard and put a lot of effort into improvement, which is is what we do <laughs> in education, right? But yeah, our teachers, if when when we hear we're tired, we're you know, we're overworking, we're tired, it's it's a real thing. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> the struggle's real. Yeah. John, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Okay. Anyone else? Ruby, thank you for throwing or putting together that report. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, moving on to agenda item 3C, financial update, Brian. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Brian. Yeah. It's freezing, so you won't turn it up, not down. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I put it at 72. You I know. It's so cold. I think I'm like sitting right there. <laughs> well, my office is at 67, so. Because this pulls my. My office. Yes. Yes, and balance. <laughs> well, I, I just have yeah. 75 out here. I just my about ready to so. put on a jacket, but I don't have one. <laughs> Do my best. Do my best. All right. No, All right. Financial update. Okay. So SFA was introduced two weeks ago, I guess now. Legislation session is supposed to be done Friday, unless they come up with something to extend it. Um, I haven't seen anything come out since it was introduced. Um, so based off of those numbers we've gone through and updated staffing as much as possible with openings and things like that, with placeholders and all that type of stuff. Um, we did build the staffing with the change in the hourly tables. Um, so our lowest hourly wage is 15.32 um and adjusted accordingly for all the different groups within the classified hour, hourly tables um, we also did build it with um, the thousand increase to the base of the certified it's going to 42,000 at a ba1 which in turn also adjusted our extra duty schedule since that is based off of the ba1 number um, so all those numbers are in um, the budget documents. So with the numbers shown in the SFA as was introduced and other information we've received for allocations for rural distributions, things like that. Um, right now we're at $14,859,000 in projected revenue. Um, and again, that's subject to change just depending upon how categoricals shake out. Um, it'll change once October count comes into effect when they do the mid-year adjustment, things like that. Um, but we are actually shown to be getting equalization of about $10,000, which I don't think we've got an equalization in four years. So that's, that's gonna be a first. Um, with everything in, there's still going to be some movement just because of some of the grants and things tied with S or three, things like that. We're still moving some of those things around. Um, I do have budgeted a transfer into capital right now of 250,000. Um, and food service, our transfer is a 176,467. So, so, yeah. And that did go up due to increased food costs and then also uh, the change to the hourly pay table. Um, but 
we've been conservative since COVID hit and always budgeted that transfer. So we haven't allocated those funds this year or last year to something else that we'd have to absorb later on. So we've been conservative the last two years. So we don't have to eliminate anything in next year's budget because we had free that money. Um, we've done some transfers in the capital last year with that with those funds. Um, we can look at prepaying some of our large bills for next year, things like that, to free up some additional revenue next year. Um, but that's stuffs. We'll look at all that stuff over the next couple of weeks once spending mm -hmm. stops and schools out. So, um, but with the numbers that are in there, we're about eighty-one percent of general fund going to um, staffing. So salaries at a little over 8.5 million and then benefits, para, Medicare, that type of stuff at um, $3,143,000. Um, we did increase some of our overhead with things for gas, electric, those types of things. Um, we did do a 5% increase. We did have to readjust high school because we weren't sure with the CTE building coming in for the first time with kids actually in it for a full year where that expense was going to be. So as of right now, that's the only building that's over budget on energy just because we didn't know where that's going to be. So that's more than a 5% increase in next year because we're getting caught up to where it should be and right. then the 5%. Um, but all in all, like I said, we have everything built with the changes to the pay tables. Um, right now with what we have in there for grants, I know I need to change it some just because of summer school. I haven't planned June of 23 yet. Um, that's all we're gonna answer three. I just haven't gone and calculated those numbers and put it in to 22 yet. Uh, but we're at almost 1.5 million in federal revenue within grants next year. And that's spread across title, um, IDEA for special ed, but the big one's gonna be ESSER 3. Because um, ESSER 3 is, I think, almost a million of it mm -hmm. for what we have written into it. So, uh, and everything that we have written into it has been approved by CDE. So ESSER 3, yeah, we're at $760,000 in there as of right now. That number will increase once we get summer school of June of 23 in there. So that number will actually go up. So I think we have about a million between the next two years because we have that those funds available through 24. Okay. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, once the SFA is approved, CDE should be pumping out all that information. And then I can finalize the funding formula side of things for general fund. Um, I am actually still waiting for allocations for IDEA, which is our federal special ed. Um, those have not been distributed yet. The only things we've gotten is SI which is the title. Um, and I'm working through that stuff with Laszlo. Um, our SWAP preliminary budget has been approved. And that's, I think next year's budget is about $111,000 with everything. So, um, yep, $111,334 is what we're at right now. So that is all I got for financial update. Any questions? I can have a question. Yeah. So if we're doing ESSER funds for summer schools, ESSER three, right, is my understanding. Yep. Both elementary, middle. Well, for elementary is covered with rice now. Right now. Okay, that's what I, for how, this, how are we gonna carry that forward, for, I guess? Yeah, so right now, that is, I mean, we've always covered it in the past, but with the shift in the availability of these funds, 
we kind of expanded the program okay. to get kids caught back up with yep. learning loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we we're finishing out the rise. You've probably heard of Aaron call project relaunch. Yep. Yep. Um, it's actually gears money. So there's all three things in one. Um, it's the governor's money that he gave out two years ago, I guess now. Um, and we get those funds through St. Brain. So that's, we have to use those funds up for the current year, but they only go through 22. So that's why we wrote summer school in the SR3 um, for 23 and 24. Okay. Um, we do, I mean, we just shifted middle and high into ESSER. It's not a huge number, it's not as big as a group of kids coming in as elementary. Because mm -hmm. I think we only run middle and high with like two teachers, and there's maybe 20, 25 kids total. And they kind of do more independent, get caught up on classes. That's more labor intensive. So we'll need to kind of figure that out and see where we sit in two years on if we still have to have as much intensive stuff to get caught up or do we go back to what it was pre-COVID where it was more getting kids caught up on reading and things like that because what they're doing now is more extensive so um I think Aaron's been working on that looking into that type of stuff but I mean we have 2.1 million dollars we gotta use so we kind of pick the low hanging fruit that that's easy to tie to salaries. So that's what kind of why we did summer school. Um, because we try to tie all of our federal grants into salaries as much as possible because there's less strings. Because if you buy stuff with it to get rid of it down the road when it becomes not useful anymore, you have to jump through hoops to dispose of it. Because like right now we have a school bus that has a wheelchair lift on it we can't get rid of unless we get a new vehicle that has a wheelchair lift on it. So you get run into some weird things like that. Um, and like if we buy stuff with Perkins money, you got to jump through hoops to say we, we don't need this anymore. And it's just so we try to tie as much as we can into the salaries or consumables. So does that answer your question? Yep, it does. So yeah, because like within 22 out of the 1.4 million we have in there, we're about 93% of its salaries. And that's due to within title, we have some carryover every year. And we use supplies as a plug number to balance it. So that's why it's not 100% salaries or and we only get reimbursed on what we actually spend. So in the end, the revenue is basically 100% salary. Except for title two, because we do buy some PD type stuff with that. Do we know anything about funding for um, breakfast and lunch? I know it was done through COVID. So all the food waivers, USDA waivers, all that is going away June 30th. That's what I heard. Yep. So, um, so what does that look like with our budget? <laughs> so like we've always budgeted not having those. So everything we've done the last two years is budgeting based off of having to sell lunches and those types of things. So we know what our revenue was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of budgeting at that number um the sfa the school food association i think administration one too they're supposed to be sending us out a tool we have to do to set meal prices and all that type of stuff um they were, they were working on that when they did their presentation was it a week and a half ago so we'll go through do that set meal prices. Um, we'll probably actually we'll increase them just because our costs are going up. So I mean, um, but I think the max we can go is a ten percent 
10 cent, not 10 percent, 10 cent. Oh, wow. Increase. <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's no inflation. Yeah. Well, and it's going to be based off of 2019, 2020 mm -hmm. school year meal costs. Oh, wow. Because we have we haven't set a we everything's been free, so we haven't said this is what a meal costs right. since then. So you can only do ten cents off that one, or that's ten ten cents annually. I mean, we can we can increase it a little bit more. It's usually ten cents annually, um, but but we can you can do more if you can justify it. Uh -huh. So that's why I mean we need to look at it and see. I haven't got the template yet from yeah. Because it's the paid lunch equity tool, is what right. it's called. Well, wow. and they must be aware of this national. Oh, yeah, program. they are. Uh, yeah. Look, look yeah. <laughs> so, <Where>? okay. <laughs> well, so, so local's waiting for USDA and the feds uh -huh. to get them okay. all the information so they can build the stuff we got to fill out to set our prices. Because okay. we have to have all that stuff to the state and say this is what we're charging. Right. Um, so we'll need to get, I've been talking to Teresa, we're going to, we need to start sending out information. It's just at the end of school, it's not really a good time to send it out because they're getting bombarded with, you got this coming up Monday to, you know, right. so we'll probably wait till school's out, send something in June, send something out again in July saying this is happening. You'll need to go out if you think you're going to qualify for free and reduced. Right. Here's the link. You can do it online so we don't have to do paper copies, all that type of stuff. Um, I know for Roundup, they did provide them with the information, mm -hmm. those types of things. Um, we'll need to get information out there again for the parent portal so they can go see what lunch balances are, right. if they want to pay for lunches, those types of things as well. So we, we know our numbers are going to like cut more than in half just because it won't be free. Right. Um, but like I said, we kind of have a good idea of what they were pre-COVID because like middle school is right around 100 kids a day, 90 yeah. to 100 kids. High school is about 85, 90. Elementary school, I think was like two something. Uh -huh. So, well, and it kind of depends on the day. Yeah. If it's orange chicken day, it's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like I said, we kind of have that. We have historicals on that. Yes. So, and like I said, we've been conservative, conservative the last two years and kept our 21, our food service fund, like we were selling meals. Not we're giving full reimbursement and everything. But we did, I mean, we knew we were gonna have more in cost, but that's helped us because now we don't have to reduce our costs because our meals are gonna get them, but, and we don't have to increase it because we know it's gonna cost us more right. type deal. So our food costs will probably be, be about the same, we're, we'll be buying less food. Mm -hmm. So, and it's already built into the budget. Right. So, yep. Other um, inflation factors that is concerned of you, Brian, moving forward? No. Um, so the high increase will hit next year's funding because it's all done in arrears. So that's why they're figuring a three and a half percent increase okay. in funding this year because it's based off of where inflation was a year ago. Yeah. So next year they'll have to come up with money. The thing that I need the watch is with Polis signing the reduction in um, property tax mm -hmm. percentages. Yes. Um, supposedly they're gonna backfill it. They're planning to backfill it, but if they backfill it, they're just gonna increase the BS factor on the other side, oh. you know, so. That's BS. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Is it going to be like the universal pre-K right. where they just try to pass stuff so it helps in November with elections? Um, and they really haven't put too much information out there yet on the property tax stuff other than the percentages that people are going to be paying is going to go. 
and they put numbers on what they think they're going to have to backfill with. I forget how many hundreds of millions it is, but it's a lot. Which that will impact us. Yes. And so the universal and the universal pre-K well too, because our reimbursement is going to go down about ten percent, or from point five to point four. So, but we'll see what happens when they get the pre-K czar in place on July first. That's what they're calling the position right now. At least on the finance side, that's what they're calling. It. I don't know what they're calling it officially in CBD. So yeah, there's going to be some changes we'll need to look at on the revenue side of things down the road. Moving forward, yeah. So. Any yeah. other questions? John, you have any questions? Nope, I appreciate oh. the work you're doing, bro. Mm -hmm. Me too, Brian. Yep. And had our first public participation meeting, and John, John and I had a nice conversation for about thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody came. Huh? Nobody nope. came. Nope. All right. Hmm. So, and we'll have another one. I have another one scheduled next Thursday, but I'm not I'm gonna hold my breath that anybody will show up. But we do it every year. It's legally required, so I have the information. Well, the information's on the website, like front page. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So, yep. And when I announced that at the last board meeting, there was two hundred some people there. So, right. between mm -hmm. online and in person. So, yeah. Any other questions? No. Thanks for the update, Brian. I appreciate it. And here's these Thank with the correct you. headings. Oh, not the ones that I have. I'll send They're them different. to you. Okay. I took scattergram out of all the headings. Oh, I didn't even notice. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Right. Thanks, you guys have a good one. Okay, 3D agenda planning. So we have a work session coming up, and let's see, that's May, June. I think it's June 7th now. Yeah, we, well, of course, backing up, we got our uh, regular meeting in May still, and then a work session and uh, regular meeting in June. And it's a great document that, tell, that shows us what we have where. I think we've, future agenda planning, I feel, um, May work sessions, I think we have everything covered. Would you, that's agenda board, health, global budget discussion. Yep, we have everything covered for the May work session, which is, of course, today. And then our regular board meeting, we have a spotlight on success. I don't know if we have an idea for that. I think we're doing PBL. Oh, perfect. Oh, good. Okay. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. PBL is a great idea. Um, I'll circle back with them to make sure that she knows that that was the name of music. <laughs> yeah. Um, EO graduation, and you have PBL on here. Um, and the ELL graduation is just kind of bookmarked. That's usually when they want to do right. it. I haven't heard anything. So, okay. Um, it may just be PPL. All right. We'll mm -hmm. through that. DAC year end report, superintendent report, um, it's typical administrator board, student rep report, uh, approval of the minutes, approval of upcoming MOU. I don't know where that stands on where they are with the MOU. Yeah, I like I normally it's not until June, so it floats, but I, I wouldn't even anticipate that being on there. Okay. So. And then the standard upcoming meetings. And then we spoke last night, of course, that we may add an executive session um, in that regular meeting for agenda planning for that next meeting. Yeah. So anything else for the May regular session that we can think of? Well, so I'm not sure this is time to discuss it because I said, so we got a bunch of questions. Do we want to talk about answering those questions? Do you still want to table that for later or what are your thoughts? I'd like to table that for later, actually. And maybe okay. you and I can sit and talk on some of those um, specifically as well, Jason, and we can bring it back to the group. Are you... The thing I think we should discuss as a group is like, do we want to answer those questions at a regular meeting? And I think what's tricky is if you and I, I mean, I'm fine if you and I meet, but like, some of those questions, I think it's important to know what people want to 
the board wants to answer those questions. I don't feel, know if we want to answer them or not. And so I think we should discuss that. All right, so let's, um, let's see, how do we want to do that with, let's have a, so we're going to have our regular agenda planning meeting next Tuesday, even though Ruby's out, right? We're, we're going to keep it to maintain that same time. Mm -hmm. Let's just, I can have a conversation with you and then we can talk about putting it on, how we propose putting that on either the May or the June. So I, right now for people writing emails, I've been just responding to the emails. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And then we can make that a discussion as a board um, in one of our future meetings, in our future meetings one, to put on the agenda. So for a future meeting, you wanna discuss whether we're gonna answer the questions or not? Well, I'm answering questions now. Or I assume board members, because the I, for me, I think I'm getting some emails just to my email. Uh -huh. If I'm doing that, I'm answering them. Uh -huh. um, and then, like, I know I have a few outstanding emails that I'm answering based on our information, our actions we took last night. Because uh -huh. I feel like some of those questions can't be answered until until we took action. Right. So, you know, like, so, like at that board meeting, there's a bunch of questions that we didn't answer. So you're answering some of those questions individually, like where the money came from Sheldon's buyout. You're answering that individually. I just want to know that. I have, um, for the, like that particular question, I, yeah, I'll just address what we can. But I mean, there's some of those questions we should not be into. Like, we are I not agree. allowed to talk about the contract. We are not allowed to talk about personal matters. I agree. So they can, right? So I will, if that's the response, like if I feel those questions are pertaining to that, that's uh -huh. exactly what I say. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. And then the other ones, I've just been... Um, looking at, like, I know a lot of the questions that came in yesterday, uh -huh. some of those, a lot of those were answered last night, uh -huh. or it was discussed last night. Uh -huh. I mean. Because we can't answer them um, um, as a group respond back all, because that would be considered a walking meeting. An email, correct. I mean, I guess the thing I'm curious to discuss, is I feel like what would be, because I don't, I don't know how you're answering these questions. Um, and so I wonder if the best thing to do would be just like at like the regular meeting, say like these are the top five questions we can answer. And we can even say if we want, we can't answer these questions. But we heard these questions here answer. Boom, 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 boom. I, I think for us, that would be a good way to address it to the, to the public. Because not everyone was at the meeting last night. Uh, yeah, but that's my thought. That's why I'm curious what the other boards think about how to do it. So one thing on that is, then are you going to make it into a Q&A, which is... No. Because if, like you can, for example, if we answer questions, uh -huh. um, if we put that as an agenda item, just trying to get it back to this, if we put that on agenda item, when does that question and answering process stop, right? So if you answer those questions, like that's what I'm finding is we'll answer the questions and then there's more that come back. So that's why I'm asking you, are you want, wanting it as a Q&A? No, I, I don't think that'd be appropriate. I think what it is is like, we, we heard some, some similar theme, but a series of questions. And I think we should say like, hey, we heard you at the last, we heard these questions come up some a few times at the last board meeting or in letters. Here's some answers. Here's the ones we can't answer. You know. No, I think there has to be some planning in advance to that on what questions you're going to answer and how you're going to answer them. So that goes back to who is going to identify those questions and mm -hmm. how are we going to respond to those. So there will have to be planning for that. Agreed. That's not bringing up the word session. And then we're all getting different emails from right. different community members. So where does that discussion go? And are we breaking laws That's what I'm with about. that discussion? Well, you have to be so careful with that. I mean, I agree. That's why I want to talk about our work session. Yeah. This is when we can talk about it. Okay. Um, 
is, I mean, we should talk about it. If we want to do it, if so, what questions? And if so, how do we want to answer it? Or, I mean, now or whenever, but I think. Well, we can't talk about it now because it's not on the agenda for today. So, right? We can't sit here and say, well, we're going to answer these questions because that's not an agenda. That would be a point of uh, order because it's not on the agenda to pick out those questions. Well, so that's why I'm trying to figure out right. how to organize that where we can talk about it. Right. right. Like here today, we can't say, okay, we're going to address these 10 questions and this is how we're going to do it. That's not on our agenda. So, well, this is what's so tricky. I'm trying to figure out how to work that in. Yeah, I hear that. So I requested communication be a separate thing on the agenda because I want to discuss these two things. I want to discuss communication plans and I want to discuss the questions. So, but now you're saying it didn't get on the agenda. Um, well, when no, you- It's not on the current agenda. Right. Communication yeah. plan was on, but at that time, I did not hear you express an interest on how to communicate response to our current questions. Right. I mean, to me. Right. So that's why that's not on the agenda. So, I mean, so I'll take responsibility. I should have been clear about the two things I want to discuss. I think, you know, I said I would like an agenda item communication. Uh, what I heard back is like, there's a little back and forth, but we're going to put it under our health goals check in. I said, Which I, I thought it was this, Jason. Right, I got it. And then I said, I would like, it to, I think it should be a separate item. And then you said, no, we're going to do it here. I think, I mean, I'll work on being more clear about what I want to talk about. But I think also, if you're moving stuff, like check in with me, say, well, what are you thinking for communication so I can explain it? And then we can get things in the right place. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Because your email talked about the communication plan. I think my email, I'll look it up. I think it just said communication. Communication context. Is that what I said? Yeah, that's why I did. Yeah. Okay. That's why I did what, why I put it in with the communication. And I can be wrong, but I remember. Well, my mistake, I'll take up. So then what do we want our plan to, plan to be about questions? I guess that's the question. Answering email questions? Yeah. Well, email or also, I mean, I felt like, I mean, just in my survey of kind of looking through the questions people answer, the questions, the letters, they, like they, they came down to like six or so general questions that we could answer because there was a lot of overlap. Yeah, it's a communication plan. That's like exactly exactly what I put on there. Okay, my bad. So going back to our agenda, are we for what we have on our standard agenda planning, that's set, correct? We're com everybody's comfortable with that with the items listed mm -hmm. on the agenda planning spreadsheet. And then Jason, we got to let me, I'll put some thought to how to, um, and actually run past Coulter on how to address the other questions as well. Great, thank you. And if just for my own knowledge, in the past, if one board member was responding to somebody, they normally had to copy me so I could tell everybody because everybody has to know what's being said as a board. Does that make sense? So it, to cover sunshine laws, I would be the one delegating that information out so that people know if you're answering a question, then they the whole board knows how you answer the question. But then you're not the one sending it. I do to so that we're not so we're abiding by sunshine laws. So when I respond to a community member, I haven't been copying you on every single. I know time. that's why I just that kind of red flagged me. I was like, I haven't seen a single email. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you want to ask for that, but that's that's mm -hmm. always been the best practice because. Um, that's how I think it can get a little bit sticky when people think that only one board member is addressing 
everything. And it's not a unified thing. Kristen, with you connecting all the board members, that's a cold question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because that's a concern as well. Yeah. Because you're you're communicating as a board, you're not speaking just on your own behalf. So when you respond, you're supposed to be responding on behalf of the entire board. So how's the whole board supposed to know what you said so that they're in the know if somebody comes up to them and asks them the same question that you guys, you're not, you don't have conflicting messages. Yeah, we shouldn't be responding as a board. Because mm -hmm. when you're responding or talking to a community member, you're, you're communicating as an individual board member. As opposed to more than two. Two board members. And that's breaking sunshine law. Get clarification. Yeah. I can get some clarification. Just because that's different from what I've always been told. So I'm writing a note. So, um, so it'll be, do we respond as a board or emails or from the public emails or speaking as an individual board member? Who should be included in the response? And uh, responding to outstanding questions from community in the emails. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Heather being copied yep. and sending it to everyone so that we're all on the same page as that. Anything else for um, council to ask regarding emails? John, do you have anything? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, I like the idea of knowing what others have, if they have sent an answer. Otherwise, you know, a person can send multiple emails to board members one at a time, and they get three or four different answers. And that could uh, send some more confusion out into the community. So, you know, knowing, and that helps us um, know each other better, knowing how the different people on the board respond and we get to know each other better. And, and uh, I think it'll help us communicate. Okay, then get, linking this back to an agenda planning item, um, let me do some research and then we can figure out how to include that in future meetings. Does that sound good? Sounds good. All right. Anything else on agenda planning? Uh, well, I just one thing I noticed in our uh, oh, no, let me get back to that. June work session. Yep. Is uh, let's see here. That's a superintendent evaluation summary. I don't think we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Um, and then I'm not sure where this goes in the next one. I'll just throw it out now. You can tell me if it's too early. For our June 7th work session, I'm out of town June 4th through 7th. So I'll either miss that meeting or if we move to the 8th or 9th, I can make it. So. So the 8th and 9th, the State Board of Education is going to be here touring our campuses. Um, remember how they had tried to plan it in 2020? Yeah. It's yeah. going to be a big deal. I don't think that okay. you're going to want to try to do a board meeting on either of those days because oh. they are going to be expecting you 
to probably be with them on several different things. Oh, really? Yes. I very good at my calendar. Yeah, they're, I was, we just solidified it because um, we've been working on it since 2020, but um, they're gonna be touring our buildings, CTE building. They're going to be doing a lot of things like in town and all that stuff. So it'll be a lot like when we had the school, the national school boards here and we yeah. did all those fun things. Mm -hmm. So I, will, I would just recommend not moving. So the board is involved in that? Okay, and that's the 8th and 9th of June? Yep. To, to what extent, I'm not sure yet, just because the planner is new. Um, but I would, I'm, I'm gonna send a note to have you guys keep it on your radar just in case you want to be involved in the tours or I know Ruby will be speaking to the group um, on the 8th, I believe, or 9th, I haven't confirmed yet, but. <laughs> they just asked for a, like a half hour presentation about our district vision mission goals. Yeah. Is that, that's yep. what they asked for, right? Yep. That's what I was planning on. <laughs> so what's the purpose of their visit? It's their annual, um, State Board of Education meeting. They usually take it to a destination and they brought a okay, test. So part. they're visiting here. Well, of course they're going to bring a test. Of course. So <laughs> like there's tons of time where they're just meeting on their own, doing their own thing. Yes. And then there's. And then there'll be structured time that includes touring our buildings, um, meeting with any staff that might be around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will have summer school going on yeah. elementary, middle. Mm -hmm. So for you to plan, you'll reach out to us or we'll just keep that. Yeah, in mind. I'm trying to get a, a finalized timeline from her. She just hasn't nailed down everything yet. So once I get that, it's really formal and it's easy to follow and all the way down to like where they're going to be and when. So oh, perfect. thank you for letting us know. Awesome. Anything else regarding agenda planning? Well, wow. so I. I so I just wonder, I mean, if I have to admit, I'd like to do the work session, but I can't do it on the morning seven. Um, could we maybe see what their schedule is? If we're gonna be here, maybe we could, or that's no, too much for you probably. I mean, once we, once I figure out what they're doing, okay, because they just, they were still going on the premise that they weren't allowed at town hall. So I don't know if they're gonna actually try to go to town hall now, because uh -huh. um, they were gonna set up at the bridge line. Oh, okay. So, and I mean, last time I was, I had to coordinate all the buses for their food trips and everything like that. So I'm like, just trying to make sure that I know. So I guess right now, um, just what I know now, I'd like to keep it where we are, but let's follow the progression to it. Okay. Oh, and as soon as I get updates, I'll just share them with you guys. Okay, great. Thank you. Anything else on that or? All right, agenda, agenda item four, upcoming meetings and designations. Or A, the meeting special events calendar. Heather has put that on the website. So if anyone um, has all the events that is currently scheduled for May, in case there are multiple board members that are attending, and people are aware of that, that um, we may be attending, but no action uh, or board discussion is occurring during those events. Or B, we have a regular meeting May 23rd. Um, our work session currently for June 7th, a regular meeting on June 27th, and then no meetings in July. Um, and other than that, we can move to um, item five adjournment. If we can have a motion and a second to adjourn. I move we adjourn. A second. Great. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.